gliel'ha detto la delegazione o no? Buongiorno, possiamo prendere, possiamo prendere posto se iniziamo i nostri lavori? Allora, ci sono notizie o no? Ma quanto ci vuole a sapere? Che dice? Allora, buongiorno, diamo inizio. Good morning everybody. Let's um, begin our proceedings already seven minutes late. As you know, this fourth session focuses on European integration prospects, global role of the European Union and projection of its policies in the Mediterranean and Eastern Europe. Yesterday we discussed and explored the issues of uh, relations between institutions, the um, topic of democracy and the um, unemployment crisis because Europe is facing crucial, uh, is at a crucial uh, crossroads with regards to its future and its cohesiveness, uh, the strength of a uh, supranational democracy um, today we're facing the major challenges which Europe faces uh, on its borders, particularly to its east and in the Mediterranean. Uh, there are issues with regard to the eastern partnership of the Union with the relationship with the Federative Russian, Russian Federative Republic, which have become uh, very difficult after the crisis and the intervention in Ukraine. And as we were saying uh, yesterday, particularly at a session with uh, chairperson's meeting, um, we do not want to have a new Cold War in Europe, but at the same time, we do not uh, want, neither can we sacrifice values uh, on which the peaceful coexistence peoples uh, is founded. There cannot be change, unilateral changes in uh, borders between states. It's not possible for uh, external decisions on the future of peoples to be um, imposed. With regard to the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean today uh, is experiencing open conflicts, which makes this uh, region unstable. Civil wars in Libya and in Syria, the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict, which has not yet been uh, settled, and also unresolved uh, issues in Cyprus, and the need for an action which um, provides for the integration of countries in the Western Balkans in order to 
complete uh, the stability and uh, the peacefulness of that uh, area. There are barbaric forces in this area which uh, instrumentalizing a, a religion are um, undertaking bloody actions and uh, taking uh, power cruelly and taking advantage of uh, areas of lower development and the unsettledness um, due to poverty compared with rich areas. We have migrants, we have people who are entitled to asylum. We are faced also by uh, the fact of uh, Christians being evicted from so many areas in the Middle East. And uh, last Sunday, there was a very important uh, common statement uh, made on this by Pope uh, Francis and the um, Bartholomew the First Patriarch of Constantinople. We believe that Europe cannot be um, absent, um, must not look away from these problems. They must, they must have a common um, policy. It must be firm. It must uh, build on the firm principles of peace. And also I want to say, and this is probably the thing which we feel to be most important at the Italian uh, presidency, something which we discussed over the last few months, uh, we believe that the Mediterranean and Eastern Europe are both uh, central issues. They should not be opposed. Um, it's not, uh, it should not be that uh, if we have a Mediterranean country holding the presidency, we talk about the Mediterranean and if a country from another area is um, Hold the presidency, uh, the Mediterranean is no longer discussed and only Eastern Europe is discussed. We must uh, continue to have an exchange of opinions and views uh, among members of parliament with the European institutions in order that there is a uh, commitment which remains uh, solid uh, despite the change of presidencies. Um, President Conti, good. Um, thank you, Mr. Kitty. Uh, dear colleagues, the weakness and the piecemeal nature of uh, the European Union's uh, actions in the Mediterranean highlight two problem areas in the current uh, phase of European construction. The lack of a true common foreign policy, um, even uh, in our, the areas closest to us, and a shared policy with regard to migratory flows. This is something which was discussed a number of times yesterday, the lack of uh, or the poor solidarity among member states and the inability of the Union to respond to citizens' expectations. Not even the serious uh, humanitarian emergency has uh, uh, brought about a change in the action of the Union. In Italy, only in 2014, more than 161,000 migrants uh, arrived. That's more than a 400 percent increase compared with 2013. We needed to uh, face this situation almost alone with the Mare Nostrum operation, which allowed us to rescue around 101,000 people, of which uh, 12,000 were accompanied uh, children, and to find uh, around um, 500 uh, corpses. Uh, whereas there, there may be even 1,800 people who were, died in um, the crossing. The this is. Um, even the European task force which was established after the Lampedusa um, events were uh, not uh, brought into action effectively and they could have made a difference recently with the only recently with the Triton uh, operation was a very hesitant uh, European intervention decided which uh, runs the risk of not being effective unless there is a stark change in the approach of some countries with regard to the migration crisis. I think the three things which are necessary, strengthen cooperations with countries of origin and transit of migrants by developing uh, mobility partnerships, programs for regional protection, which are uh, indispensable ways of bringing Europe's action to the areas of origin of migratory phenomena. And second, secondly, assigning uh, the processing of applications for um, asylum to um, posts, out, outposts of uh, Europe in 
outside uh, countries so that we can uh, screen and separate people who have the right to asylum to those who don't. And then a fair distribution on the south side of the Mediterranean of uh, migrants who have uh, right to asylum among European countries in line with the provisions of Article 80 of the uh, Treaty on the uh, Functioning of the European Union. I believe that only in this way would it be possible to um, find a, to make a contribution to um, separate people who have the status uh, of uh, asylum seekers from uh, traffickers of human beings. I think this is an issue on which we need to focus much more in our discussions among ourselves as well. Having said this, I return the floor to Mr. Quito. Thank you. Now we'll begin with our keynote speakers. Our first keynote speaker is um, Ramon Luis Balcarcel Ciso, Vice President, European Parliament. To ten minutes, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, President. Ladies and gentlemen, my speech is going to focus on two axes. Firstly, challenges of EU neighborhood policy, and secondly, the reaction of the EU in facing its neighborhood crisis. In relation to the first, I would say that never before since its creation in 24 has European neighborhood policy seen its objectives so compromised. European neighborhood policy is more necessary than ever before. However, its objectives are at risk more than ever before. The ENP was born with the idea of creating a zone of stability, security, and well-being in the east and southern areas of the European Union. Democratic movements like those in Tunis in 2011 showed how citizens fought for a better life to defend their freedom for the respect of human rights and for the fundamental freedoms. However, in the last few months, many other countries in our neighborhood have been subject to political, economic and security crises. From the spiral of violence in Libya or Syria to the Ukraine conflict and the possibility of a third intifada in the Palestinian territories. These crises remind us that the objective of European neighborhood policy is more important than ever before. We need it to support social and structural changes in the countries of the EU and its neighbors. We must promote the rule of law, the respect of human rights, and the transition of market economies by guaranteeing security and prosperity of their citizens. For this, the EU uses various types of incentives. On the one hand, it uses economic incentives that are backed up by the principle of more for more. The more reforms that take place, the greater amount of financing offered by the EU. In total, the EU is going to pay out 15.4 billion euro in the 2014-2020 period in order to help its partners in the south and the east of Europe. Another type of incentive is political incentives. In this way, dialogue is established for human rights, immigration and visas based on association agreements. We should also talk about trade incentives. Countries receive privileged access to the European market and to the five million consumers with the greatest global purchasing power. However, the European Union doesn't just defend its values of democracy and human rights. It also brings those countries closer to itself. The ENP favours the adoption by our partners of European legislation and standards, and in this way creates a comparative advantage for our businesses with regard to third countries. We should add that to the benefits derived from a climate of stability and prosperity in our immediate environment. In relation to the reaction of the EU to the neighborhood crisis, I would say that our neighborhood policy is based on the fact that we should adapt our action to the specificities of each of these countries. In that vein, the EU has introduced a growing differentiation between its partners based on their progress and their reforms. The European Parliament has 
supported and supports these strategic changes. The action plans established with our partners are adjusted to the needs and expectations of our partners by establishing correlations with their own national development plans. For example, bilateral relations with the EU as part of the ENP complement multilateral relations which are developed in the framework of other fora like the Eastern Partnership. These instruments have shown themselves to be useful and necessary. But the question is, are they enough to tackle the crises that are facing our partners in the south and east of Europe? The Union is facing challenges that are more and more diverse, and therefore it's important that we as Europeans reflect both on the EU and on national parliaments on how we should modify European policies in a world that is constantly changing. In the south of the Mediterranean, we should support the growing Tunisian democracy so that it continues on the path towards the consolidation of its democracy and its public institutions. On the other hand, Libya has entered into a spiral of sectarian violence and it needs the EU to mediate in the reconstruction of national unity. Lebanon and Jordan must face up to the growing flows of Syrian and Iraqi refugees as a result of the instability in those countries, and it needs significant support from the international community. Different countries with different challenges, they all require different instruments and approaches. Add to that the different expectations which each of these countries have in the relations with the EU. In the east of Europe, the escalation of violence in the Ukraine is worrying. Putin's vision of a new Russia is a Russia which wants to regain its influence and, if possible, control the territories which one day formed part of the Russian Empire of Catalina the Great. So he promotes the policy of Russian integration with countries in the Euro-Asian region. In some cases, like in Ukraine, he has even used what the armies call hybrid warfare by combining conventional troops with militia and cyber attacks. In all countries, Russia is seeing that governments are decentralizing their competencies and giving greater autonomy to the Russian supporting areas. In many regions, these countries are strategically important. The recently annexed Crimea is a extremely important geopolitical region because of its geographical location and because of the naval base of the Russian fleet in the Black Sea in Sebastopol. This is just another illustration of how the EU must act with its neighbours, in this case, Russia. Russia is going to be more determining for the success of our neighbourhood policy. The same occurs for our neighbours in the south, where Iran, Qatar and Saudi Arabia play a key role in what is happening in Iraq, Syria or Lebanon. The EU has not remained with its arms crossed facing Russian pressure on Ukraine, Moldavia, Moldova and Georgia. These countries want to come closer to the EU and with that objective in mind, this year they signed association agreements with the EU. Faced with the prohibition and obstacles which they are suffering in their ec trade exports to continue having access to the Russian market, the EU has responded by giving temporary trade preferences to Ukraine and Moldova so that they can thus alleviate the economic impact of the reduction of exports to Russia. The European Parliament has fully taken on its responsibility by ratifying the adoption of those temporary trade preferences and the association agreements. The European Parliament decisively supports greater involvement of the EU in countries in its neighbouring south and east. In that vein, it 
helps these countries in their democratic development and in their political reforms through various initiatives, namely its plans of technical assistance to national parliaments, its electoral observation missions, which inspect the organization of elections based on international standards, as well as the parliamentary delegations, which supervise the implementation of reforms suggested by the same aforementioned electoral observation missions. This is in order to ensure a democratic and transparent political system. The so-called parliamentary diplomacy is particularly useful in, as, in that we, deputies, we feel freer than our governments to deal with issues like violations of human rights with governments and parliaments of third countries. The EU's credibility in the international sphere will greatly depend on the success or not of its efforts to stabilize its neighboring areas. Therefore, President, we must react more quickly to the political changes in our neighborhood by showing real political leadership. It's also crucial to have coherency in our actions. We must have coherency between member states, between the EU institutions, and also between the EU institutions and member states. National and European parliaments have a significant role to play by demanding and guaranteeing this coherency. This is not about having one sole voice in the EU. Rather, it's about having a common and shared message and sending that message out to the world. United, we are stronger. Only through the EU can its member states recover a certain amount of influence in the world. Together, we represent 26% of global GDP. Together, we are the largest economic area in the world with 500 million consumers. Together, we represent 20% of world trade. No EU state could alone tackle climate change. No EU state could alone tackle nuclear proliferation, nor could they face up to the economic or financial crisis or international terrorism. Only together can we defend our democracy and our system of freedoms, our social and environmental standards. Because the world, ladies and gentlemen, needs Europe to return to the international sphere, and it must return united. It must unite the talent of its women and men. Only in this way will we be able to decide our fate. Otherwise, we run the risk of turning into mere, ex mere spectators. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Barcalcesiso. And now we get to the floor to Senator Claudio Martini, member of the Senate Committee on EU, EU policies and uh, one of the two reporters on uh, the um, investigation the Senate has carried out into the situation in the Mediterranean. Ten minutes. Thank you, uh, President. Dear colleagues, for me, it is a great pleasure to um, present this statement uh, following an investigation, an inquiry carried out by the uh, European Affairs uh, Committee of the Senate and uh, which had myself and uh, Senator Gianni Mauro as rapporteurs. The macro region of the Mediterranean should be considered as a um, co consistent system, which uh, is a single area of reference. There are a thousand differences and specificities inside it, but there are many features and priorities which are shared, as is also highlighted by the European Parliament in its uh, resolution of the 3rd of July 2012. In the Mediterranean, the model of cooperation is uh, something which uh, we need to emphasize. One of the starting points is the outlook of the Treaty of the European Union, which uh, states that uh, it will develop privileged relations with neighboring countries in order to establish a space of prosperity and good neighborhood 
founded on the values of the Union and characterized by close and peaceful relations based on cooperation. This is Article 8 of the EU Treaty, and this uh, provides the codification of the European neighborhood policy. It uh, sees uh, outside countries around the Mediterranean as uh, essential uh, counterparts as well as the countries of the Eastern Partnership um, which, with which specific cooperation agreements can be established. Cooperation can be of differing degrees based on the uh, different level reached in the relations between individual uh, external countries and the Union. The factor referring to the fundamental values of the Union makes it possible to uh, adapt relations flexibly, not only to uh, relate them to the compliance with certain uh, criteria, particularly protection of human rights and uh, compliance with the rule of law, but also take, to take into account uh, specific political situations. The Arab Springs of 2011 and their consequences are therefore not neutral factors in the overall assessment uh, Europe should uh, carry out with regard to the intensity of the level of relations to be established with these states. Furthermore, we need to take into account the fact that um, non-EU states in the Mediterranean area, unlike the situation for some countries in the Eastern Partnership, do not for the time being have the prospect of uh, entering the Union because uh, they're not uh, considered as U European states, which under Article 49 of the treaty can uh, request accession. But this does not do away with the need to provide a um, frame framework for political reference, allowing these uh, states in the broader Mediterranean, which um, enjoy a dense network of relations and common interests with the member states of the Union to develop a uh, essential cooperation with us Europeans, which cannot be limited to economic. The economic area must also encompass the cultural and social dimension. And we cannot ignore that after the uh, proper uh, emphasis placed on the enlargement to the north and to the east uh, of uh, Europe, it's necessary to restore strategic priority to the southern borders of the Union, to the Mediterranean. This is something which needs to be done because otherwise it would remain without any uh, political reference. The um, political center of the gravity therefore also has to have a Mediterranean horizon, otherwise our geostrategic interests will be overwhelmed in the short term by the power of the United States and uh, China, who are already very active. In order to do this, we, however, need to be aware of the fact that we should not repeat the errors of the past. The cooperation of European states with Mediterranean countries has to be uh, established by totally discarding a neo-colonial logic and adopting new paradise. If we do this, we will have already accomplished half of our task. We need a new philosophy and new instruments. And we need new paradigms in all, because the Barcelona process has uh, already uh, lost its uh, momentum and it is necessary to um, present the issue of relaunching the Mediterranean in, in different terms which are more modern and inclusive. Cooperation between member states and the countries of the Mediterranean area therefore has to be made part of a new um, vision of partnership which goes beyond the limits of bilateralism and emphasizes a, uh, really, a, a real community approach. Um, we will need models based on decentralized cooperation capable of giving uh, a appropriate value to sub-national levels and to uh, partnerships with the requisite flexibility to ensure the feasibility of programs. Today, within the Barcelona process, they are made rigid by um, government uh, planning and the political constraints 
related to it. In this outlook, we need to give due value to projects in the cultural sector and targeted uh, to our new younger generations. I'd like to uh, indicate some points. The first point is the institutional process. We have to give renewed legitimacy to the process of North-South institutional cooperation. We also need a new um, political reference framework. And uh, the second point refers to the conditions of the institutional process. It has to be based on an equal footing and on the, on the principle of reciprocity. Member states on the north of the Mediterranean must cooperate on an equal footing with those of the southern side. Um, the third point concerns the social and cultural dimension. The Mediterranean must be a concrete opportunity for uh, growth and work of younger generations. It must also be a, a place where culture plays an irreplaceable role in strengthening the development process and giving due value to uh, neighborhood and uh, commonality among our peoples. Um, and recently, a event um, which was organized by the Conference of um, Peripheral and Maritime Regions in Europe. A Mediterranean strategy for the Mediterranean was envisaged where decentralized multi-level cooperation can is provide a link between the northern and southern sides of the Mediterranean, which the Barcelona process has been unable to provide with adequate effectiveness. And I would suggest that we all uh, consider these proposals and this development. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you, Senator Martini. And now I'd like to give the floor to the chairwoman of the European Affairs Committee of the Parliament of uh, Latvia, Ms. Uh, Lolita Chigane, who will also be hosting uh, COSAC uh, next because she'll be taking on the uh, presidency of the Council. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It has been already pointed out in the previous speeches that the year 2014 is indeed a year of radical challenges. One can even say it's the moment of truth for the neighborhood policy of the European Union. This reality cannot be ignored. Military expansion of Islamic fundamentalists in Iraq, Syria, and Libya, as well as Russia's blatant aggression in Ukraine, significantly destabilized the EU's southern and also eastern regions. These regional tectonic geopolitical changes now pose a threat to the EU's own territory, economy, and also integrity. Can we deal with them by assessing or perhaps even reforming our current regional cooperation policy instruments, the Union for the Mediterranean and the Eastern Partnership? I deliberately put the two EU foreign policy directions, the Middle East and the North Africa and the Eastern Europe close together since only the EU ability to deal with both of them will give the so much desired global credibility to the foreign policy of the United Europe. Both regional policies must not be opposed to each other, neither in the official statements nor in the behind the scenes bargaining process and fighting for the scarce funding. And this was very duly pointed out by Mr. Bordeaux already. It is my deepest conviction that by indulging member states' temptation to prioritize their geopolitically and, and culturally closest region, the European Union is losing its strongest asset, solidarity and unity. Unfortunately, the division and inability to look beyond narrow regional interests is sometimes the weak point of the European Union. In Latvia, we cannot pretend that the huge territory in Syria and Iraq controlled by the so-called Islamic State, a safe haven of extremists, does not concern us. The Islamic fundamentalist movement causes major threats for all EU, and as pan-European challenge calls for engagement of all member states, of course, including us. Similarly, here in the south of Europe, 
we should not ignore the situation in Ukraine, Moldova, and also Georgia. And this has been duly pointed out by the Italian presidency, and I'm very happy about this. The Eastern Partnership will be one of the priorities during our upcoming presidency, and the Riga summit should set in motion a fundamental revision of it. There are lots of practical matters that should be considered during the Riga summit. For instance, taking stock of the signed association agreements with Ukraine, Georgia, and, the Mol and Moldova, and searching for new cooperation models in the areas of mutual interest with Belarus, Azerbaijan, and also Armenia. However, along these practical matters, an in-depth discussion has to be conducted on at least two key outstanding political issues. First, setting out clear and fair goals within the Eastern Partnership. What should be the outcome of this initiative for those partner countries with a true aspiration to join the European Union one day? Second, and most challenging, how to build relations with Russia. Dear colleagues, I am convinced that the, re the reviewed Eastern Partnership must convey a clear political message that Ukraine, Moldova, and also Georgia will have an opportunity to start EU accession negotiations at some point in future, after completing all the required democratic reforms and ensuring compliance with the set criteria. Yes, no one has doubts that the reform process will take a very long time, perhaps even decades. However, a clear perspective of accession will be the best motivation to make serious and significant reforms in the partnership countries. In my view, till now, the Eastern Partnership has been focused on an overly technocratic approach, similar to that applied in accession negotiations, but did not give partners a clear prospect of closer EU integration. And we also d discussed this yesterday when we discussed uh, the conclusions of our conference. Eastern Partnership should be diversified with a tailored approach to each specific partner country, as was already pointed out by our distinguished first speaker in this panel. In recent years, I have had the opportunity to visit Ukraine frequently. And during these visits, I was surprised to witness the growing support for the European integration in Ukraine. Thank you for believing in us and helping us. We also want to be where you are now, in Europe. That was the common message in all conversations that were facilitated by my knowledge of the Russian language. According to the latest surveys, public support in Ukraine for the EU membership is approaching 70%. Ukrainians who fearlessly stood under sniper bullets in the Maidan last winter or who know as volunteers are fighting against Russian-backed separatists and Russian regular forces in Donbas region are driven by, desi by desire for freedom, rule of law and sense of belonging to the broader European space. These are the same principles on which the European communities were created by their founding fathers, Schumann, de Gasperi, and Adenauer. That is why the Riga summit will seek to agree on relevant roadmaps, including strong and supportive signals for Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, with a perspective on either accession or a special privileged economic and political partnership in the distant future, as was already mentioned by the previous speakers. Second, and the key issue, that's on Russia. Unfortunately, Putin's Russia has been escalating the conflict aimed at the requisition of the control over former Soviet space, as was pointed out already. Annexation of Crimea, arming of Donbas separatists, as well as involvement of re regular Russian army units on the territory of Ukraine attest Putin's imperialist goals. A couple of days ago, I came across a quote. In March 2014, Europeans woke up in the Vladimir Putin's world. I can fully agree with the firm approach by NATO on Russia's possible further aggressive behavior. But thinking of, of long-term solutions, we are still far from finding them. As a representative of a country with a long history of the Soviet occupation, I would like to point out that before restarting EU's relations with Russia, a radical change in Russia's behavior is needed. First, 
Russia must respect the sovereignty and full territorial integrity of Ukraine. That would allow the EU to withdraw the majority of sanctions. Second, and more importantly, Russia has to fully recognize the European choice of the Ukrainian, Georgian, and Moldovan people. Unfortunately, for now, Russia is showing no signs of willingness to de-escalate the situation, and its troops are still present in Ukraine. I wonder whether in the current conflict, Putin sees the world as a zero-sum game, where only one can be the winner, rather than search for a win-win compromise for all. I am, however, afraid that in the eyes of Mr. Putin, any compromises could only be a sign of weakness. Dear colleagues, one can agree that the European neighborhood policy faces challenges of unprecedented complex, uh, complexity. However, I truly believe in the Europe's force of solidarity and ability to find a solution even in the most complex and difficult situations. This has been a major driving force of the European integration, and we have previously tremendously benefited from that. The Riga Eastern Partnership Summit has the potential to become a major milestone for the fundamental review of the partnership. It has to use the opportunity to give our partner countries a clear roadmap for the enlargement perspective in the more distant future. At the same time, the European Union should, should speak clearly and straightforwardly with Russia. I will be glad to see all of you at the events of our parliamentary dimension of the Latvian presidency in Riga. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to give the floor to Senator Giovanni Mauro, who was a co-rapporteur in the Italian Senate's inquiry into Mediterranean. You have five minutes. Thank you, uh, Presidents, dear colleagues. First of all, um, a heartfelt thanks to the excellent uh, statements we've heard. These are statements which call us to um, a more thorough analysis. Again, this is not something which should be a, a formal, uh, simply formal matter. I don't believe that our meeting can uh, end with uh, a, a list of uh, statements which reflect our national uh, positions. I think that we're at uh, a situation where the Europe of parliaments, the Europe of uh, states cannot fail to deal with the issue of the Mediterranean and the issue of the Mediterranean and the Adriatic, um, not just in uh, geographical uh, terms. We have to consider this is a macro region. Inside our macro regions, there are a number of uh, problems, a number of prospects, but they all have uh, a very um, great meaning for what we will be uh, in future as Europe. The governments of our nations, you see, have um, a major limitation in having to deal with uh, emergencies. They have to deal with crises as they develop on a day-to-day -day basis. We parliaments, who are the direct representatives of the people, have a duty towards future generations. We must uh, give a forward-looking solution to um, problems. Just to consider one population um, factor. I live in Sicily, which uh, is a forward position of Italy in the Mediterranean, but the whole of our country, the whole of Italy, in uh, 2050 will have an average age of the population of 52. Uh, the Maghreb area as a whole in 2050 will have an average age of uh, almost 25. This contact between peoples in the same area, in the same uh, region, um, has to be one of our areas of uh, discussion and consideration because uh, the w you cannot stop the flow of rivers with your hands. Disasters cannot be addressed um, when they 
produce uh, overwhelming force. And so we need to look to our future generations. We need to build in these areas, in the Adriatic and the Mediterranean. But uh, I would focus more on the Mediterranean uh, uh, perspective of uh, peace and prosperity based on what we managed to sow in the heart of the new uh, European and African generations. Um, our There must be two types of outlook, uh, cultural uh, education to the brotherhood and uh, neighborhood, and also the understanding of um, our mutual interests in shaping uh, a common future. And therefore, uh, concretely, uh, distinguished college, we need to work on high-level university education, which uh, also provides for cultural growth together. But there also has to be uh, religious and cultural uh, interconnection, because if young generations can uh, study together and be shaped together, together they can also determine the governance of these macro regions and economic cooperation cannot be seen. Senator Martini was quite right in saying this uh, from a neo-colonial perspective. It cannot be seen uh, as a way to uh, achieve an advantage for one side against the other. We have to create a Mediterranean bank and other things where economic relations are truly concrete. Uh, we need to be concrete in our relations. I would stress Europe will be uh, great. We will be significant in the world system if we manage to uh, address this um, very important issue, which should just not only just have e economic and demographic uh, consequences, but uh, on which uh, well-being and peace also hinge in justice, in the right, in the uh, recognition of. It's not just our um, histories which are all uh, ancient, uh, but we have to create a new history too. Thank you, Senator Mauro. Now we have 26 people on the list of speakers, and therefore I uh, would close. Sorry, we've got 27, in fact. So um, I will now close the speakers list. So you have 27, as I said, and therefore we can uh, adopt the same approach as yesterday. One minute per statement, and then we'll have a response from our speakers. First, uh, Mr. Speer from Germany. Thank you very much for giving the floor, Mr. President, to distinguished colleagues. Uh, the three speakers have just uh, showed us in a very impressive way why it is necessary to work in partnerships with the neighbors of Europe. It's something that is an imperative for all of us. They've also shown, however, that our neighborhood policy has to be adapted to the present circumstances. Certain things have gone wrong in the neighborhood policy the last years, I'm afraid. This is because we were not able to adapt our policy to the developments as they unfolded. And in the Weimar Triangle, France, Germany, and Poland, the foreign ministers um, drew up a paper a few months ago in order to say what their view of this uh, neighborhood policy is. And uh, the high representative, Federica Mogherini has already said that she intends to take on this role in a very serious way vis-a-vis -vis the Commission and the Council on European level. And it's very important to take all of these various aspects into account and not just see the national levels, but also the regional and local authorities and to involve them very strongly in neighborhood policy. That is something that the Committee of the Regions has been doing for quite a few years now, but this role could be further intensified, ladies and gentlemen. I think if we try to build up neighborhood neighborhood policy from the bottom and not just from top down, then we're going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. 
Distinguished colleagues, in April in Marseille, on the initiative of Martin Schulz, President of the European Parliament, um, the first um, uh, conference of the Mediterranean took place, uh, which was chaired by Greece, uh, and the Mediterranean parliaments that came together there showed their willingness uh, and their preparedness to help the Mediterranean region out of the crisis, but also to give new initiatives and impulses in the situation. Nevertheless, the situation in the meantime has become even worse. The refugee flows in the direction of Italy, Greece, Cyprus, and Malta have further intensified. They are still on the rise, and therefore, we have to have more economic and financial support for Frontex, which is in charge of um, uh, protecting the eastern, the southeastern border of um, the European Union, which is Greece. We have to realize that, and our coastline is very, very long. It's as long as uh, almost as long as Africa's, and this is something that we have to take very seriously. This EU border has to be carefully watched and protected because it's the only way that we can actually do something against the situation. Our mutual goal must be a Mediterranean basin of peace and friendship, of cooperation and uh, well-being, and that is certainly also our Mediterranean strategy as it's defined. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Mr. Lambert, France. Mr. Colleague. Colleagues. The armed conflict which exists on the doors of the EU at the east and south marks the failure of the international community and a risk of losing our influence. How do we look at this situation? Well, we have a lack of cohesion and solidarity on our part at times, but we also have a lack of comprehension of the political, social and historic situation of our environment. In the Mediterranean, thousands of young people are involved in the conflict. How do we prevent these people from many countries of the Union feeling um, far from all of this? In Eastern Europe, this situation has caused bloody conflict. The hope is that we will see a new democracy in Ukraine. In that vein, Europe must provide stability and must not be used as a cause of division for Ukrainian people. This is why we must act by pursuing dialogue with all stakeholders, dialogue with Russia that is guilty for the unrecognized borders on Crimea, and we must also ensure that we recognize the people of Crimea by giving political support. Europe must engage in dialogue and peace in areas that are affected. Europe must exist in the international diplomacy sphere, but also in military terms to ensure that we can defend our shared interests. We have a long way ahead, and here we must share the will together. Thank you, Mr. Galazewski, Poland. Okay. Pan przewodniczący powiedział, że nie chcemy. The uh, president said that uh, we do not want a new Cold War, but we need to consider that um, beyond the European borders there is a hot war which uh, everybody is speaking of. And therefore, uh, uh, the new neighborhood policy and uh, the new uh, CFSP are imp very important with regard to the uh, foreign policy of the European Union. But the situations in the south and in the east are different. In the Mediterranean, we have internal problems in individual uh, countries, including Syria. Whereas in the east, we have a different situation. We have an aggressor. We have an imperial country. We have one of the largest countries of the world, and there are uh, frozen uh, conflicts in Georgia and Azerbaijan and in Armenia. These conflicts uh, could um, be um, activated at any point by Russia. So 
<coughs> aid from the European Union for reforms in these countries is, is very important. Our negotiations with Russia are also very important. Based on our experience, we know that with Russia we can hold good negotiations when we are strong. And therefore, if some countries believe that they can negotiate uh, with Russia and do not believe in the strength of unity among our countries, uh, they are wrong. Señores. Thank you, Mr. Sabate, Spain. Gracias. Thank you, President. Certainly, we've said that we risk entering into a new Cold War. This situation is undesirable. Thus, we must make efforts to reorient our relations with the Russian Federation. EU action should be based on the respect of international law and the respect of existing borders and the rule of law. That is an inviolable principle. We must also recognize our mistakes. Otherwise, we are just fooling ourselves. We must, for example, recognize the fact that the 20th February agreement with Ukraine was a mistake and it went against international treaties. Therefore, the EU's role must be reformulated. The situation with Russia has shown an escalation of violence. It involves a lot of countries in the EU, including Spain, and obviously the escalation of expenditure and defense, as mentioned by the Parliamentary Assembly, is putting pressure on us to increase our defense budget. So we need to make a diplomatic effort to move forward in the situation to ensure that we have peace, collaboration, and stability in the future. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Mr. Bizet, France. Monsieur le Président. President, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, allow me to speak about enlargement and the President Juncker's decision to pause the enlargement process. Clearly, the Balkan countries and their perspectives for EU membership are uh, something which we should look at. We need to ensure that any policy in relation to justice or financial uh, balances is crucial in terms of their membership. As for the Mediterranean, certainly we should not be satisfied with the current situation on the Schengen policy. Certain countries must have an economic policy which ensures that candidates can have a future. In terms of Ukraine, I was delighted to see the decision taken by COSAC today. Grazie. Thank you. And Mr. Jelkowski from Poland. Sorry, afterwards. I'm sorry, I made a mistake, but by now I've given you the floor, so please take the floor. Okay, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be starting. I do apologize for that. We all need a wake-up call. We must be aware that the international situation has drastically deteriorated. We face these two dangers from the south and from the east. Russia is trying to change by force internationally recognized borders, and in the south we've got this destabilization, cruel war, and migratory flows. In order to do that, we don't have only to defend our borders, but to act in a positive way in the neighboring countries, be it Ukraine or some other countries, to help them to implement necessary reforms. But to deal with these dangers, we have first to be united and then to act in a quick and effective way. Europe is maybe a giant, but in a foreign policy, it's a very feeble, slow, and inefficient giant. So our policy must be not only reactive, but proactive, prepared in advance to deal with different possible scenarios provoked by irresponsible or dangerous behavior. Naturally, there are some signs of hope. The recent fully transparent democratic elections in Tunisia or the recent elections in Moldova 
And let me add one more thing. We must give the countries of Western Balkans, be it Serbia, Montenegro, or the former Yugoslav Republic, Macedonia, a clear perspective of membership and not only some vague promises of cooperation. So I do agree with our conclusions, but we badly need not only words, but more deeds. Thank you. Grazie. Signora Strick. Ms. Strick from Holland. Here we face the largest refugee crisis ever. Almost 90% of them is hosted in fragile developing countries. Our external border controls force refugees to take dangerous routes and make them dependent on smugglers. I praise Italy for the life-saving operation Mara Nostrum, but I'm concerned about the gap that it will leave when it's taken over by the Frontex uh, Operation Triton, as it is much more small-scaled and limited to the Italian coast. What does Italy undertake to prevent that more lives will be lost after the withdrawal of Mara Nostrum? The Task Force Mediterranean called for creating safe legal channels for refugees, and UNHCR has asked for 100,000 pledges in the EU for the most vulnerable Syrian refugees, as the neighboring countries of Syria cannot cope with it anymore. But for this purpose, the EU resettlement policy must be reinforced and become less permissible. I think Germany is the only good example in this regard. So my question is, what did the Italian presidency achieve in this regard? Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blaha from Slovakia. Thank you. Uh, European Union is based on the liberal culture of human rights and I fully support it. And let me even congratulate to our Finnish colleagues to the adoption of the gay marriages. However, I think we should respect other cultures and not to enforce our Western culture to every region in the world. When talking about Russia, we should respect its Orthodox culture, though we don't like it. As regards Crimea, Slovakia doesn't recognize its separation from Ukraine as well as we do not recognize separation of Kosovo from Serbia. But we are very skeptical to sanctions. Ordinary people suffer from economic war, and it's blatant. The results are risky. If Putin's regime collapses, then the extreme nationalists can gain the power. We need stable Russia, not the furious nuclear power on our border. We shouldn't believe in war propaganda about Ukraine. This country was run by oligarchs, and it's still run by oligarchs. Ukraine is strongly divided and the only solution is federation and neutrality. If we want to have a peace in Ukraine, we should find a compromise also with Russia and to listen to Donbass people too. Clash, this conflict is not the clash of the angels and the demons. It's a typical superpower struggle and Ukraine is the victim of it. We do not need the bombastic solutions, but we need realistic, peaceful solu solutions and we need to improve our relations with Russia I call for more realism, I call for dialogue, I call for peace. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. And now Mr. Dufresne, um, Belgium. Colleagues, we're worried about developments which have taken place recently in the Ukraine. But let's not be intimidated. We should continue to support and encourage the countries who have chosen to have a political association and economic integration with the European Union. We must also restore dialogue with Russia by ensuring that we have our arguments clear. This is history here. If we want to see enlargement in the East, and if we want it to be successful, if we want to reunify the continent of Europe, then we need to do so peacefully, without any new fractions with Russia. We must involve ourselves to ensure the success of the partnership in 2015. Belgium will use the presidency of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe to be a lot more present in the region and will send a constructive message out. In terms of the Mediterranean, we need to strengthen our migration policy, our common migration policy, and fight against trafficking in human beings. This is the message I want to send out. Thank you. Grazie, grazie, signor Presidente. Thank you. And now, Mr. Dolidze from Georgia. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate for invitation of Georgia here. I think that's a good uh, kind of channel of communication, first of all, for us to debate and discuss all these painful issues. 
I think that Georgia is doing really well in terms of its home working, in terms of NATO integration, in terms of European Union integration. We close the first chapter of the visa liberalization action plan and very carefully are we are preparing for Riga summit and appreciate Latvian colleague for its very, I mean, concrete and very uh, constructive, I'd say, approaches and of course Polish delegation, because how deep Russia will go, nobody knows. What's happening in Ukraine, what Putin is doing on the ground, and plus, despite the fact that Georgia is doing all for normalization, by bilateral relations, trade, uh, humanitarian, or any other economic relations and ties with Russia, unfortunately Putin is signing the so-called cooperation agreement with Abkhazia, and now I guess with South Ossetia as well. So we have to not only be concentrated on uh, sanctions, which is as well, very important, but on defense capabilities increasing, I mean, in Ukraine, in Moldova, only for defense and not, not of course, I mean, offense levels. And Russia finally should know that strong, democratic, and European, Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova is a guarantee of regional stability and Russia's stability itself. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Grazie. Thank you. Mr. Tekeliolu from uh, Turkey. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear colleagues, as all you know, uh, a stable and secure Mediterranean region is in the best interest of the EU. As a country which has deep social, political, and economic ties with the countries of Mediterranean, Turkey has an important role to play in intensifying EU's partnership with Mediterranean countries. As all you know, because of the brutality of the Assad regime, the total number of Syrian refugees in Turkey reach it over 1.6 million. We expect the EU to show the desired attention to this problem, which possess serious threat to the stability in Mediterranean. Dear colleagues, uh, with regard to the Cyprus issue, we have the consistent view that the hydrocarbon resources are to be used for the benefits of all Cypriot, Cypriots. Turkey is the best and optimum road for sending these resources from Cyprus to Europe, which will maximize the mutual benefits and contribute to peace and cooperation in the region. Dear colleagues, the recent political crisis in Ukraine has shown the EU needs to be a more influential actor in the Eastern Europe. In this problem, the dialogue channels with, with Moscow must be kept on. In, co in conclusion, the EU must immediately get involved in problems and avoid leaving the solution to these solutions of these problems to the United States of America. We believe that EU should definitely increase its cooperation with Turkey on foreign policy issues to become a real global player. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Mr. Cardoso, Portugal. Obrigado, Sr. Presidente. Thank you, President. Dear colleagues, uh, to speak of the role of the European Union in the Mediterranean means speaking of uh, North Africa and uh, the Iberian Peninsula, and um, in particular Morocco and Portugal, because of their um, capability of producing electricity from uh, renewables. Uh, solar energy and wind energy, and uh, Portugal is an excellent geostrategic position and can represent an alternative as a source of energy for Europe um, instead compared with Eastern Europe. And therefore, the European Union should um, fund energy links between the Iberian Peninsula and the rest of Europe with the supporting the gas and uh, oil uh, pipes across the uh, pipelines across the Pyrenees. Thank you for having uh, allowed me to raise this issue. Mr. Edemir from Turkey. As the Social Democratic member of the Turkish Parliament, I welcome calls for a stronger commitment of the EU in the neighborhood and an enhanced global role, not of words, but deeds. This first and foremost, requires a bold and proactive strategy, not introversion and reluctance. Declaring no new members for five years and conceding to the absence of an enlargement portfolio is at best 
a call for a black hole in the Western Balkans. One can't help but compare the timid myopia of the Fortress Europe tactic to the bold and transnational expansion strategy of illiberal and violent forces actively recruiting not only from the EU neighborhood, but also from the EU metropolises. The biggest risk for the future of the Union and the transatlantic values would be the failure to take risks by hiding behind imagined walls of a phantom fortress. Peoples of the neighborhood will either join the Union as citizens of prosperous and stable EU member states of the future or as refugees fleeing failed states of the neighborhood. The decision is ours to make on both sides of the Phantom Fortress. Grazie. Thank you. Mr. Sutour, France. President. Thank you, President. The Mediterranean policy of the EU was overturned by the Arab Springs movement. Since March 2011, new financial instruments have been aimed to consolidate democratic reform. Today, the Union needs to continue in that vein. The priority accorded during the Lithuanian presidency, which seems to be continuing under the Estonian president, Latvian presidency, in terms of neighbourhood policy, should not be to the detriment of the Mediterranean. The EU must implement innovative policies with Morocco. It should maintain current financing of EU neighbourhood policy, one third of loans for EU Eastern Partnership countries and the remaining for the countries in the Mediterranean. We should optimise the use of these funds. Let's avoid any comparisons with uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and aid toward Eastern Europe. The countries in the Mediterranean are in the same block. The, we should not exclude any cross-cutting efforts to ensure continental cooperation. We should allow countries in the Mediterranean to move towards the other countries. Our cross-cutting cooperation through the Union for the Mediterranean is a strategic role, and I would say that I congratulate I'm delighted to see that Greece and Italy, under their presidency, respected the balance between Mediterranean policy and the Eastern Partnership, and I hope the same occurs for Latvia and that they don't just focus on the Eastern Partnership. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Mr. Banner, Hungary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear colleagues, in my opinion, the sanctions against Russia are not proper actions for solving the Ukrainian crisis. I think that this question is managed one-sided by the European Union. Ukraine has to make more gestures for its minorities. As a Hungarian MP, I see the situation from the aspect of the almost 200,000 Hungarians living in the western part of Ukraine. Hungary is responsible for this community. However, the Ukrainian electoral system works against the interests of the minorities living in Ukraine. It is a very bad message after the signing of the association agreement with the EU. I believe that supporting the Hungarian minority is not only a Hungarian question, but a European one. The European Union should help all of the autochthonous minorities. There are many ways for this. As far as I'm concerned, I think that some kind of territorial autonomy would be the best solution. Thank you for your attention. Grazie. Thank you. And Mr. Tomczyk, Poland. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the first uh, thing uh, is a uh, quotation which has occurred to me from Montesquieu that the worst evil is not uh, strength but the weakness of the good. And uh, in this context, I think that we can ask ourselves, what is a compromise if uh, country A takes over a part of uh, country B? Is a compromise possible or is the situation uh, so clear that the uh, answer is uh, immediate? Um, the uh, country which is an ex-member of 
with the uh, Warsaw Pact. We've been uh, in NATO 15 years and 10 years. Uh, we've been in the European Union. We're a country without any complexes. We are a normal country. And therefore, on the eastern flank of the European Union, we need democracy and integration. And this is uh, something which uh, began in has begun in Poland, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, and uh, in uh, Estonia and uh, Latvia. Integration and democracy have served these countries, and therefore we have a completely a different uh, reality. I'm very glad because I'm young, and I'm very glad to be able to enter into this democratic world without any conflicts, uh, which is uh, different from the situation of my parents. We're in a situation where we uh, Ukraine is uh, trying to integrate, but uh, its big brother is trying to prevent it. My country was in a similar situation. Uh, Russia didn't want Poland to be a member of NATO or the EU. We had President uh, Walensa. We had a good, uh, we're in a good situation. We had Solidarność. And now we need a new solidarity with uh, Ukraine and with the eastern flank of the European Union. Um, more and more people understand that Russia is not a strategic partner. And therefore, I believe that Russia is no longer a strategic partner for the European Union, but has become a problem, a strategic problem. Thank you. Signor Androkovic. Thank you, Mr. Androkovic, Croatia. Poštovani gospodine predsjedniče, kao prostor temeljnih vrijednosti, demokracije i vladavine... Um, distinguished uh, President, the uh, European Union has a great responsibility towards its uh, southern and eastern neighbors. And uh, therefore, it is uh, key in these areas. In order to uh, uh, carry out this function, it's necessary to have a unitary policy in the countries which are not uh, direct neighbors uh, of the European Union must be uh, assisted because they have an influence on uh, the European Union. Greece has uh, spoken of the problems which relate to uh, neighborhood in uh, southern Europe. With regard to eastern Europe, it has been seen that the potential of uh, eastern Europe uh, also influences the uh, relations throughout the continent. And this is very important for the future of the European Union, and therefore we need to be brave and active. And there are conditions there has to be a community of uh, intentions and uh, a common policy. Thank you. President, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the Italian presidency for your excellent hospitality. And I'd also like to congratulate the Italian Presidency and the COSAC Secretariat for the excellent organization of this event. I'll be focusing on the issues of the Mediterranean. We all know the facts. There is a rise in social problems, more and more refugees and asylum seekers. There's violation of human rights. There's exploitation of human beings by other human beings. There are two ways to deal with this. First of all, we need to understand that the peoples of the Mediterranean, the peoples of the Mediterranean themselves also have to understand that we are interested not in exploiting them, but rather we want to provide them with help. We want to give to them. And of course, this is something that we have to understand ourselves, that this is exactly what we have to do. And secondly, the European institutions have to define values which will actually allow them to uh, provide the mechanisms which are necessary to alleviate these problems. The uh, cooperation between Erdogan and Putin with respect to natural gas and, uh, pro and provision thereof to the Eastern Mediterranean is a key point here for the good of all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Canas, uh, Portugal. Thank you. I would uh, like to uh, support uh, what was said by our keynote speakers and um, stress the case of Tunisia 
uh, Tunisia was where the Arab Spring began, and Tunisia is the only case of uh, a positive outcome because Tunisia chose uh, its own path. It drew on uh, outside models and uh, adopted them and still uh, needs uh, European support. And another comment, we should not simply look at uh, details. The sub-Saharan region is very important and we have Mali where our French uh, friends undertook a bold and targeted operation and it is a region which continues to need uh, Europe. The whole uh, a region is uh, at risk, and this is a risk for the whole of Europe, not just uh, southern Europe. Therefore, we need to pay attention, not just uh, a, a remnant of attention. Mr. Fotio, Greece. President, in our neighborhood we have 200... 200 Syrian refugees who have been on a hunger strike for a week now in front of the Greek parliament. They demand food, shelter, medical care, and some are even asking for work, but also, obviously, political asylum seekers are amongst them as well. The situation is further exacer exacerbated by the war in Syria. 500 more refugees were rescued off the shore of Crete just last week, as you know. The Greek government is very much aware of the needs of these persons who are neighbors, but it is unable to cover their needs. If it calls for the implementation of Directive 2155, I ask you whether Greece will actually receive the direct su support it deserves and which is entitled to for providing protection to these Syrian refugees based on the solidarity of all member states. And secondly, I ask you um, we all, whether we all realize that refugee flows are a problem, but not only for Greece. The EU must take urgent measures, i.e. issue visas, as per the demands of the UNHCR. There are now 3,209,138 Syrian refugees in the countries in our immediate neighborhood. So I ask you, when and which measures do you intend to take in order to transfer these refugees safely to EU member states? And I ask whether there will be financial support for search and rescue mechanisms in the Mediterranean for Cyprus and Greece, as was done with the Mara Nostrum plan in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hannigan, Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Ireland continues to see further enlargement and integration as a means of promoting peace and democracy throughout Europe and beyond. But there's no doubt that enlargement fatigue is growing in many member states. And in Kiev at the Maidan, uh, we saw people come out in the streets and push uh, for the way of life and the values that we in the European Union uh, take for granted. And we need to reflect on this. And I think it's unbalanced uh, for us to tell candidate countries that the sole reason uh, for delayed integration is down to their failure to reform. Enlargement fatigue is as much to blame, and we can put the, the, the reasons for fatigue down to a, a number of factors, such as the slow pace of the institutions in relation to dealing with the economic crisis, uh, the attitude of some member states to the rule of law, and, and the scapegoating of migratory citizens in some member states. And statements by President Juncker that we won't see further enlargement during his tenure, while factually correct, uh, can be seen by many as unhelpful in this regard. It's our role in our positions to fight uh, the issue of enlargement fatigue and to push for the benefits of further integrations and to sell that to our citizens. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Um, it's Lideka, Lithuania. Gracias, señor presidente. Uh, cher in order to become a truly strong player in foreign policy, the European Union uh, must speak with a unified, principled voice supported by resol uh, resolute actions. We must undertake a greater responsibility for ensuring security, both at the European Union borders and anywhere else in the world. The European Union has always advocated diplomatic solutions to even the most complex issues. However, Russia's aggression against Ukraine forced the European Union to respond by introducing appropriate sanctions. To achieve peaceful solutions, 
of the conflict. The sanctions must be supported by the entire international community. It is therefore surprising that some countries seeking membership of uh, the community and uh, committed to increasing its foreign policy alignment with European Union common positions, don't support uh, the common position of all of us. For example, Serbia. Taking this opportunity, I would like to remember the election in Moldova, which took place two days ago. What does uh, the pre-election company show for us? We're upset watching uh, the increasingly explicit promotion of third parties' interest uh, throughout the Mediterranean, the Eastern Partnership countries, and even the European Union. New television channels uh, are launched uh, to tell about the root and west and populist and extremist parties already openly funded by Russian banks, uh, um, established with an above it paper. We must respond to these tendencies. Smooth integration of Balkan and Eastern partnership countries into the European Union would contribute to ensuring peace and stability in the third regions. We must therefore offer the membership perspective to the countries aspiring for European Union membership, as this would um, strengthen the Union security and prosperity. Merci. Grazie. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, President. European borders are, belong to Europeans. And it's important that we remember that during difficult times, particularly now in the COSAC uh, session, we are experiencing difficulties. We need action on a European level. In terms of security migration, we cannot do this solely by using military uh, actions. In relation to the borders on the Mediterranean, I won't go into detail on the other issues particularly the Russian border, but in the Mediterranean we also need cooperation and development policies to create an area of stability around the European Union for those nations and for ourselves, for the dignity of life of everyone. We must ensure that that takes place at the borders. Another thing, we need a corridor for refugees. We need in 2014-2019 to tackle this situation. We need to be effective and we need to do that in times of difficulty in particular. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you very much. And this is the last speaker, Mr. Mifsud Bonici Malta. As a president, I thank the dedication of the team to the Janet Colla. This is a great moment to bank the proof of the European this is a moment for our uh, Europeans. My country is um, re watching with uh, all that is happening in Libya and the Middle East in the, the Ukraine. Obviously, these are the frontiers of Europe, but now this is the moment of truth. How can we respond? How can we respond to this? I am sure that these uh, meetings should encourage us. And now um, we are capable to really bring peace, solutions in such an important region. Obviously, my country is obviously involved with what is happening in uh, Libya, but also what is happening in Tunisia. The, the world is not only uh, dark, there are things that are happening well. And uh, as you said yesterday, you quoted Shimon Peres, the most careful thing to do is to there. I really hope that Europe will there. Grazie. Grazie. Thank you. So now um, we have the final... Uh, comments of uh, speakers. We've now 
have uh, Mr. Godzi um, with us, the Under Secretary. To and I'd like to ask the speakers to make an effort to keep to seven minutes in their replies. And I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Chigane first of all. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you for chairing this excellent debate. Uh, really, a lot of fruitful discussion, uh, very many good, fresh ideas, confirmation of already stated important issues. So really, thank you so much uh, to everyone, especially for us Latvians as uh, the incoming presidency. This has been really enriching uh, to be here and listening to all your opinions. And I would also like to particularly thank our colleagues from East European countries uh, that were so well describing the burdens that have been posed on you uh, by the events uh, in uh, Maghreb countries and uh, North Africa and uh, as a result of the Arab Springs that you so well uh, described. This has been a tremendous burden on uh, uh, on borders, on infrastructures, and we really need to deal with these burdens that have been posed on us mm -hmm. in, a, uh, in a way of solidarity and, and uh, with a strength uh, that is, uh, that is um, influenced and motivated uh, by the understanding that uh, this is not an isolated problem of one region. And in that respect, I think that uh, the point that Mr. Spinrad from Germany, our German colleague, raised about the necessity to strengthen our regional and local authorities is really very important. Uh, we can discuss that at the national level and we can exchange views, but they are the ones who are at the front line of uh, receiving, uh, receiving uh, threats and receiving co consequences of those different conflicts. And this goes also for those countries that are, for instance, neighboring Russia, which is becoming more and more aggressive. So I really welcome that focus. Uh, I also uh, carefully listened to those who called for a dialogue with Russia and said that we shouldn't be threatening Russia with further sanctions because it harms the society, it harms economically the Russian people, and that is indeed true. Uh, we see that the Russian people are really suffering. For instance, we as a uh, country that borders Russia see that um, Sometimes people come uh, to the border municipalities to buy basic food supplies because uh, of the sanctions. However, I have to very firmly stress uh, the common wisdom of international relations. It takes two to tango. Vladimir Putin does not want to talk with us. He does not want to negotiate. He left the Brisbane summit early. He did not want to talk with anyone. How can you discuss was someone who just wants to realize his imperialist visions and imperialist tendencies that were very well pointed out here. Of course, the burden on the Russian population is huge that is posed by sanctions, but what other means do we have to convince Mr. Putin that this is totally unacceptable, what he is doing both in Crimea and also in Ukraine and also previously in Georgia, as our colleagues mentioned. I also very much uh, welcomed and with a great interest listened to the comments about the approaches to further enlargement. Indeed, there is an enlargement fatigue, specifically given all the many challenges that Europe is now facing. However, I really agree with our Irish colleague who said that enlargement is not a goal per se. It's not a geopolitical, uh, uh, geopolitical interest or a necessity to expand the sphere of interest, as sometimes is termed in uh, the Russian propaganda. It really is not that. Enlargement is an instrument for peace and stability, and we have all have interest in promoting that. Of course, the question of uh, enlargement is not the question of the nearest future. However, it's very important to show the, to, to the countries that might wish to consider uh, further integration at some point that that perspective is open, no matter how long it takes. It might take, as I already stated in my speech, even decades, but it's very important to keep that goal and that uh, door open. So I would like to thank you everyone uh, once again for the fruitful discussion. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure we will 
continue this very fruitful discussion du during our COSAC meetings that we will be chairing in Riga. Uh, of course, given the geographical location, we will probably have more in-depth views on Eastern partnership rather than on Mediterranean, but for that reason, we very much look uh, upon to your contributions uh, in our COSAC meetings so that we can really have a balanced and uh, well-phrased approach to everyone. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Senator Martini. Yes, thank you. I also greatly appreciated the input from uh, all the discussants. I was struck by the fact that uh, it was possible in a single discussion to keep uh, a conjunction between two very different uh, themes the issue of uh, cooperation to the east and cooperation in the Mediterranean. They're two sides of the same uh, coin, but they are two very different uh, issues because uh, we're dealing with uh, different uh, areas. I simply want to stress a, a political issue which I've um, noticed in a number of um, the comments uh, without without um, neglecting the problem of Russia. We do um, feel the need that after a period of enlargement to the north and to the east, very positive and very important, uh, with, even with the um, issues which have um, ensued, that the center of gravity of Europe has to be somewhat uh, relocated by paying attention to the southern border of Europe. These are not contradictory things, and I think this has been uh, stressed by a number of the people who have spoken here. Let's take the matter of immigration. Um, I've heard references to Frontex, Triton, Mare Nostrum. The problem of um, this flow of migration is certainly it's something which we need to deal with together, but we also need to deal with it not just at points of arrival, but if possible, as far as possible, at points of departure of migrants. And this means that we require a policy of dialogue with the countries in the, to the south of the Mediterranean, North Africa, and uh, the Middle East, which is something which needs to be uh, carried out together, it cannot be done simply by the uh, neighboring countries. And uh, the more we deal with the issue at points of departure, the more benefits will accrue. I um, uh, welcome the comments I heard from the uh, first speaker, the German colleague, who said that we need to uh, assess the uh, results and the outcome of the policy of cooperation. I think this is very important because not always um, has this policy, which has been given lots of resources, been able to uh, produce a positive outcome. And that's why I um, have um, proposed the idea that after 20 years of the Barcelona process, which did open up pathways, but which also turned out to be inadequate, we now uh, should try to define new paradigms and uh, new um, conceptions of this um, policy, policy of partnership. And I think we need to do this with a decentralized approach, putting together Europe, member states, and all the decentralized instruments of uh, uh, regions, uh, metropolises, and um, major regions. Another final point, um, I was um, very much um, struck by all the comments on the experience in Tunisia, which uh, everybody has judged to be positive, where it's been demonstrated to be uh, to combine an expansion of democracy with people's participation. I think that we need to look to this with a sense of European uh, responsibility and with the awareness that things would not have turned out positively there unless there had been 
the presence, the willingness, the availability of Europe uh, to be close to give a hand and to help this process. And I know uh, Tunisia uh, very well. Uh, coincidentally, I also uh, I was born in that country as an uh, from a um, emigrant uh, family, which is not just um, uh, economic and political. It's also cultural, institutional, and an ongoing relationship. Uh, of a new uh, governance capability, new civil society, and a new um, relationship of equality. So we commend the positive result of uh, Tunisia, and we hope that um, this will allow us in other situations in Egypt and Syria, Libya, to have this uh, active presence which will produce positive results in the management of migratory flows and all the problems related to trade relations. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. And uh, President Valcarta El Siso. Muchas gracias, President. Thank you, President Kichi. I agree with what, uh, with the thanks which my previous speakers have given for all of your contributions, which have been extremely interesting. Firstly, I would say that to Ms. Sigan and then to Mr. Martini. Mr. Martini is a good friend of mine for many years. 90% of speeches here today were focused directly on Eastern neighboring countries. So that means quite a small percentage in relation to the Mediterranean. Be that as it may, both issues are interesting and it's something that we have been committed to recently. You are doing so in your own countries. The European Parliament is doing so. European institutions are doing so. And in addition from local and regional authorities, we are also doing so. One extremely interesting speech about the local and regional dimension in tackling these realities was also presented. In relation to the Mediterranean, we understand that the EU should show its will, its political will, and it should be coherent and effective for the Mediterranean. The EU should use all instruments available for its neighborhood policy. The same should occur for pre-accession of member states in order to in promote democracy and security of citizens. This also comes in line with something which occurred this morning, and I think it's something that moves all of us and forces us all to become more committed, particularly in relation to the immigration law. I agree with the speakers who have said that we need to focus more not on intervention, military intervention, or um, the armed forces, which certainly are necessary or inevitable sometimes because borders are borders. But as M Mr. Martini said, we need to tackle this problem at its source. That is key. Therefore, we need to focus on the countries of origin so that we cannot just provide money. We're providing money at the moment, but we also need to spread the EU's values based on good governance, democracy, and the defense of human rights. We must have a relentless fight against mafias that traffic in human beings. This is key. I said I was going to talk about numbers something that I don't like doing, but I'm going to have to do that now. At the present, while the US devotes approximately 20% of its foreign direct investment, Mexico and South America or Japan invest 25% in its south to China, Thailand, Indonesia, etc. The EU devotes less than 2% to the southern area of the Mediterranean and two Eastern countries. So you can see 
we have a long way ahead of us and we need greater commitment to ensure that we can move forward on the correct path. Enlargement in the EU has allowed Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine to be closer to the European Union today. They now have, they have profound aspirations to be part of the EU. Our main objective is to strengthen political, economic and cultural integration with these countries. Mr. Bolwell called my, I was struck by my German colleague who mentioned building a down up approach and to involve regional powers and local powers, not just national powers in all of this process to supporting the south of Europe and the east of Europe, our neighbor countries in the south and east of Europe. In the Committee of the Regions, where I was a member up until just a few months ago, two committees were created, two working groups were created. One is the local assembly, the assembly of local and regional powers of the Mediterranean, and the other is the CORLIP, a partnership with neighboring countries in Eastern Europe. I'm honored to preside over both groups. And so you can see that I'm only in full agreement with my German colleague here. Another issue relates to the Russian-Ukraine conflict. Our Slovak representative said that this is an issue of giants and that Ukraine is the victim here. I don't really think that that is the case because I don't think we're talking about a struggle between Russia and the EU. We're talking about Russia's attempt to reorganize and take back the lost empire of the past. And this should generate concern. The EU needs to react. Maybe we reacted late. Somebody denounced this. We could have taken, a, certainly we might have taken a long time to react. The European reaction is maybe a bit too slow in terms of diplomacy. It's also true, however, that we must ensure that Putin's ambition to recover this empire is not successful. Many other countries, some are aspiring and some are already part of the EU, could be, could end up on the border there alongside the country trying to build that empire. I think this debate has been very fruitful and interesting and President Keaty, I wish you all the best of luck and I thank you for wisely presiding over this meeting. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Uh, President, and now uh, Under Secretary for European Policies of the Presidency of the U Italian Council of Ministers, Mr. Gozzi. Thank you, thank you, President, and thank you, colleagues, for giving me the opportunity to um, address your assembly for the second time on an issue which is a priority and essential for Italy and Europe and which uh, begins with um, two protagonists who we believe uh, in and who we think will be able to make a major contribution to strengthen European policies to the east and to the south, which are the uh, high uh, representative Federica Mogherini and the representative for uh, neighborhood and enlargement, Johannes San. We think that these are two excellent choices which, uh, and they will definitely be um, very important uh, and active figures in many of the things which we have before us. With regard to enlargement, we've already um, expressed ourselves uh, yesterday, Prime, Italian Prime Minister and ourselves. We felt no need to um, uh, call uh, for a five-year standstill in enlargement, but we will certainly um, strive to ensure that and, and I'm sure that uh, Federico Mogherini and Johannes Sanz will ensure that um, this will not reduce the intensity of an essential task to continue in the process of enlargement. 
um, and first and foremost in the Western Balkans. Um, I think that uh, enlargement is the major policy success of the European Union. It's a, a decision which we um, took uh, out of a spirit of uh, generosity and in the same way that uh, we've uh, also wanted to um, generously to um, uh, subscribe to the reunification of Germany. We made no self-interest calculation. We uh, acted out of a sense of history. We hope this sense of history will also be applied to the Mediterranean. The discussion we've heard today has been very positive. Um, I think that we've made a step forward and um, I've heard other things. This is, um, there's a uh, no need for a um, juxtaposition between East and South. I think it's obvious that they're two uh, major priorities, and it's also clear that the Mediterranean is um, an area of common interest where the Mediterranean country, which has um, um, held the Eastern Partnership as, as essential, and also the relationship with Russia. This is something which we've done. We've um, undertaken important attempts. We've always tried to put all the actors in the conflict of the Ukraine uh, around the table because we thought this was in the interest of Europe. We haven't done this thinking of the immediate interest of the Mediterranean. We're sure that the uh, Latvian presidency will do the same for the Mediterranean, for Libya. And uh, Libya was um, under um, estimated, it was being neglected uh, in recent months. The problems of uh, security and migration from Libya, which not only have their effects in Italy, they have effects in uh, Hamburg, in uh, Stockholm, and elsewhere, and we need to deal with these with the same intensity with which we dealt with the issues of the U of Ukraine and with which we've um, worked for a ceasefire in Ukraine and in the same way that we've uh, worked for the withdrawal of illegal forces in eastern Ukraine. And uh, we've done everything possible with uh, the European Union to ensure uh, security at the Russian-Ukrainian border. This is the spirit with which we can make a difference, which requires consistency, not selfishness far-sightedness, a bit more solidarity. And uh, what we spoke of uh, in terms of economy yesterday is something which we can speak of today in foreign policy. Unless, uh, colleagues, we uh, stop opposing our national interests, if we uh, continue to oppose the interests of the center and the east and the, center, uh, the interests of the uh, south, we will uh, go nowhere. We need to build up a bit more mutual confidence. I think there's quite a lot to be done. There, and we need to build up among ourselves mutual confidence. The true capital which we lost during the crisis is that during the crisis where we made huge blunders uh, to oppose the interests of creditors and the interests of debtors. These are consequences which we're paying very dearly in foreign policy today because what we need to do to have a real foreign policy is to reestablish a, a relationship of confidence among ourselves. You have to have be able to be uh, trustful that uh, a representative of the Italian government will deal with problems of the East and problems of the South in the same way, in the same way that we uh, need to have confidence in others that they will um, focus on both in the same way. Then we can deal with technical issues, but political activity and due uh, representative uh, European democratic legitimacy, that we need to do a lot. We need to do a lot for our consistency too. And uh, a lot of you have raised the problem of the um, rule of law, basic uh, rights. And it's obvious that we're losing credibility in our promotion of fundamental rights and the rule of law because we are not as demanding with ourselves. And that is why at the next uh, Council on General Affairs, which, we, which will be the conclusion of the semester of uh, presidency of the Council of the Union. We put the issue of uh, rule of law and fundamental rights at the top of our agenda. We want a new commitment on the part of the Council to um, have a new uh, policy of fundamental rights inside the Union and deal with the issue of rule of law inside the Union and to have it once a year at least or twice a year a debate on uh, the state of uh, rights and uh, rule of law within uh, the Union. This is something which Euro European Parliament does, but the Council has always refused to work on 
a pillar of uh, European treaties, Article 7, um, in the preamble indicates as a pillar of our union the respect of the state of law and the respect of fundamental rights. Quite rightly, we uh, demand this uh, respect of uh, candidate countries. We rightly require this as a condition for our neighborhood uh, partnerships, and uh, quite rightly, we have human rights clauses in our relations with uh, external countries, but it's obvious that we need to demonstrate that we're also uh, demanding with ourselves, and uh, this is an internal issue, but on this, it, uh, they're all, it, um, our capability of having a leadership role depends too because on the issue of the rule of law and fundamental rights, um, Europe has to return to be a leader and has to return to being respected. In order to do that, we have to continue to work on uh, consistency. And uh, you spoke of the need for success stories. I agree with you. We need success stories. Tunisia represents today, and we hope it will continue to represent a success story in North Africa and in the Mediterranean, we at uh, the European Community, we um, uh, have um, done well to support the uh, Tunisian's transition and uh, the Tunisian constitution, which is an advanced constitution, not only for North Africa, but for our own uh, criteria. But we need to convince our public opinion that um, success stories can also be developed in the uh, north of the Mediterranean. The first visit of uh, Mr. Renzi was to uh, Tunisia in this uh, semester. Um, he did this for this reason, for the reason which um, I've said, because we wanted to give a signal and we wanted to say symbolically, we trust you. You can make it. We believe in you. And that is what we need to do. The European Union has to show not only that it believes in itself, but that it believes in its ability of making a difference in its relationship with the East, with uh, Moldova, Ukraine. There were elections. The, rep the Lithuanian representative uh, mentioned this. We'll see which government comes out of these elections. Uh, if the new government um, confirms the uh, European leanings of uh, Moldova, this is something we need to support. All the uh, all um, uh, movements towards European Union have to be supported, and that's why we have taken a very active and uh, supportive position of uh, Ukraine. And I conclude with the uh, issue you um, discussed of human flows. I say human flows because in these flows there are uh, women and children and men escaping from war. There are people escaping from famine. We cannot criminalize them before because of this. We have different obligations in the two cases, but in both cases, we need to uh, provide a response to people who escape from wars and people who escape from persecution, want to save their lives, but also to those who wish to avoid dying of hunger. And then we have uh, flows, human flows, which are called terrorism insecurity. And when we respond to that, we have to have a policy of common integration which also applies to the neighborhood and which will have its first major impact in the neighborhood towards the east uh, and to the south. We think that this is a very important uh, principle um, which came from the uh, Council of Ministers for Internal Affairs in Luxembourg where we spoke of external borders, not just the external border, which we're most interested in, obviously the Mediterranean, but we spoke of external borders in general. We have a principle which is shared now. It was uh, proposed by some countries before and now all countries subscribe to the point that external borders are common borders of the European Union and they require common initiatives on the part of the European Union. They need to be dealt with on the basis of the principle of shared responsibility and they need to be dealt with on the basis of the principle of solidarity. This has uh, allowed uh, the Triton uh, operation which has um, complemented and replaced the Mare Nostrum operation in Mediterranean. This is also important for our neighbors in uh, Eastern Europe because the principle which applies today in the Mediterranean, but tomorrow will apply to our eastern borders too if necessary. And this is a part of the uh, response which has to be a part of our neighborhood and foreign policy and which needs to be connected to another aspect. And here I conclude. A few days ago, there was a meeting of all European African responsives uh, on the Rabat uh, process. We 
we uh, need to work, it is clear, to construct a new shared commit, um, commitment among European countries and African countries, not just North Africa and the Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, but also the Horn of Africa, for a common management of migratory flows in exchange for um, a new um, uh, order of uh, economic assistance. These, this has to be two of the major priorities which has to be developed by the European Union in future years, and this is where the European Union can demonstrate its added value, can demonstrate that it's still worthwhile working for Europe, still worthwhile believing, believing in the European Union, because the European Union, where it can provide added value, also uh, presents uh, tangible and concrete solutions. Thank you, President. Thank you, Under Secretary. So, um, colleagues, we've now uh, completed this session. We have a coffee break, I suggest that we keep it to 10 minutes and that we can return at 11.45 because one, we have one final session and then the adoption of the final document. So I'd like you to ask you to be back at 11.45. Bene, io direi di dare inizio, cari colleghi, all'ultima sessione di lavoro. Ok, welcome back, colleagues. Now we're going to move on to an unprecedented theme for our conference, democratic uh, monitoring of European agencies. This is a specialized issue, but it it's also important because it has political implications and it calls into question the role of the COSAC. The creation of an increasing growing number of agencies, 46 according to the most widespread uh, classification, despite the indication of the treaties, is one of the most, uh, one most important and uh, contentious developments uh, within the European Union. These agencies were established by European legislators in order to establish a number of uh, highly technical uh, activities, collecting information, strengthening cooperation between national European administrations, providing uh, assistance, taking decisions relating to specific cases and uh, uh, overseeing the application of uh, European law. In actual fact, they also um, have a number of regulatory powers. Um, it's enough to uh, refer to the decisions of the European Banking Authority and the other two authorities working in the financial area, which have produced uh, a significant economic impact. As uh, indicated in the biennial report, these agencies are generally considered as effective instruments for the implementation of European policies and can provide an important uh, contribution in terms of expertise and uh, information also for the decisions of uh, national parliaments. At the same time, uh, there are widespread concerns um, with regard to the powers attributed to them. <clears throat> the proliferation of um, structures and costs uh, attached and also the lack of uh, adequate mechanisms for their uh, democratic accountability to be um, established and their work to be scrutinized. Uh, substantially, the role of agencies uh, uh, raises a crucial issue uh, the European level and the national level, the relationship between technical bodies on the one hand and politics on the other. The goal of this session is therefore to answer a basic question. Within which limits and uh, in which environments is it legitimate and appropriate to delegate wide-reaching powers, uh, also regulatory in nature, to bodies which are not? envisaged by the treaties. To answer this question, on the one hand, we intend to uh, examine options to strengthen the link between uh, agencies and national parliaments in order to uh, allow the latter to fully use the potential offered to them in terms of enrichment of information and necessary expertise to exercise their legislative functions, uh, develop policies, and exercise uh, scrutiny. And uh, we also want to uh, assess the adequacy of the democratic accountability mechanisms which exist and uh, uh, evaluate possible improvements. Having said this, we now 
move to the session uh, proper. And we too have two very eminent uh, speakers, Morten Kierum, uh, director of the FR, AFRA, the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU and coordinator of the Network of European Agencies, who we will give uh, the floor to for 15 minutes and our colleagues, William Cash, who chairs the uh, EU Scrutiny Committee of the House of Commons for seven minutes. And uh, now I wish to give the floor to Morten Kierum. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much for the invitation, honorable members, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a very great pleasure to be here today. What I think is actually the very first time that there is an uh, actual interaction between COSAC and the uh, EU agencies. And uh, I very much hope that this will not be the last time, uh, but it will be uh, uh, the beginning of a long and fruitful uh, interaction. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, have been given the chance to uh, have this exchange on behalf of uh, all the uh, EU agencies that we are currently uh, chairing. And uh, the agencies generally is very pleased with the interest of the national parliaments uh, in their work. And uh, we very much hope that uh, this meeting and this exchange uh, can be the beginning of a more uh, a deeper collaboration. In order to bring the agencies closer to your expecta expectations and your needs. I would like to spend my time first giving a short, brief uh, overview of, of the agencies and, uh, and then go on to uh, discuss the issue of the functioning and democratic controls of the agencies, the ac accountability. The EU agencies are important, uh, compo uh, important component of the European Union. They were created to meet specific needs on a case-by-case -case basis. They're set up by the European Parliament and the Council of the European Union to carry out very specific legal, technical, or scientific tasks. We work alongside the main EU institutions as well as member states. We deliver expert advice to help shape evidence-based laws at the EU as well as the national level. We carry out risk assessments, perform supervisory functions, and certification tasks. We identify, assess, and communicate current and emerging threats. Around the world, respected and well-known agencies, such as the Food and Drug Administration in the US, have been created exactly to give expert advice to their national administrations. So the EU agencies were similarly created to help implement EU policies more efficiently and to respond to particular needs identified by the EU institutions and the EU member states. But the agencies are not only essential for the implementation of EU policies and programs. They enable economies of scale. In many sectors, agencies reduce the overall costs to taxpayers. If we put it simply, it can often be cheaper to do a task once at the EU level than to replicate it 28 times at the national level. And just to reassure you, it's an issue that often emerges about the cost of the agencies. I can tell you the agencies, all the 40 agencies, consume only 0.6% of the overall EU budget. Let me give you briefly some examples of the work of the agencies. So what, what is it in, in substance that we are addressing? Getting here, coming to this meeting, many of you either took a plane or a train. As you know, the safety of flights, of your flight, was ensured by the European Aviation Safety Agency, EASA. Since 2007, there has not been a year with over one fatal accident 
involving an aeroplane operated by an EASA member state. It's quite an achievement. Moreover, it's no longer necessary for each member state to issue separate certificates. Now we have one single certificate system that covers the entire European Union. This represents great savings of administrative cost, and more importantly, it ensures universal respect of safety standards. Similarly, in the past, the train going from Brussels to Rome would take several certificates. Now only one certificate is needed issued by the European Railway Agency. Thanks to the work of this agency, the EU citizens enjoy one of the safest rail sectors in the world today. The agencies also play a vital role when it comes to our collective security. The international organized crime is becoming still better organized and cross-border. Here again, EU bodies are at the vanguard. Europol's European Cybercrime Center is, the, is in the forefront of combating borderless cybercrime. The Eurojust, the EU's Judicial Cooperation Unit, coordinates investigations and prosecution across all member states. In 2013 alone, it assisted over 1,500 financial crimes, cases of terrorism, human and drug trafficking, fraud, corruption, cybercrime, as well as organized environmental crime. Of course, to this family of justice and home affairs agencies, we also have Frontex, which has been mentioned here several times today, as well as my own agency, the Fundamental Rights Agency. And here we just point to one feature among agencies, is namely the close interaction between agencies. We are releasing the Fundamental Rights Agency, will release a big uh, study early next year on extreme exploitation, or you could say modern day slavery in Europe early next year. That came out of discussions we had with our colleagues in Europol that had detected uh, this issue and were quite frustrated about the inaction in that regard. This is now moving good collaboration between uh, the two agencies. We have other clusters of agencies. We have uh, the medical agencies, the medical agency in, in, in London, as well as the disease control agency in Stockholm. We have food security agency, etc. It's a very wide uh, family, big family, with a number of different uh, key elements to address, but all issues which are of great concern to European citizens. So let me move on, and I would say that I was very pleased when I read the report for your meeting here, when I noticed that 16 out of the 33 uh, parliaments and chambers uh, that had replied to it said that they had had interaction uh, with the agencies. What is more is that it seems that the majority of you actually would like to expand the collaboration. So again, I think let's get started, let's go, get going, and hopefully next year when we meet again maybe, uh, we could see that it's not only 16, but it's all of the national parliaments which at that time have actually had some sort of interaction with one or more of the uh, agencies. Let me assure you that the willingness is very much also on our side. Let me now turn to the issue of accountability and provide you uh, with brief information on the existing mechanisms on key control uh, features. The governance structure is agreed by the Commission, Parliament and the Council uh, in the agency's founding regulations. So how we are governed in our everyday life is you find in our founding regulation. And normally you find representatives from each member states and the commission. Then in some agencies you will find on top of that uh, representatives from the European Parliament, from key stakeholders or observers. So that is the more or less standard structure of an agency, the governance structure. Most agencies receive their funding largely from the EU budget, 
with an exception of the fee receiving agencies that collect fees and charge for their services. And there are actually two agencies which are fully self-financed. EU-funded agencies receive their funding on a quarterly basis. Each quarter, they apply for an installment explaining what the money the funding is needed for. The Commission may decline this request if they find that the agency has sufficient funds from previous installments. So there is already every quarter a check. EU-funded agencies receive their funding uh, as I said, and the accounts of every EU-funded agency is biannually audited by the European Court of Auditors and, as you well know, discharged by the European Parliament. The agencies are also regularly audited by the Commission's internal audit service that looks into the agency's internal procedures, efficiency, and not least, their performance. Three European parliam parliamentary committees regularly assess the work of the agencies. These are the Constitutional Affairs Committee, the Budget Committee, and the Budget Control Committee. They determine each agency's annual budget and scrutinize how each agency has spent the money before deciding whether the budget can be discharged. On the substantial side, the specialized European parliamentary committees follow the work of the relevant EU agencies on a daily basis. In our case, we mostly refer to the Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs Committee, the so-called LIBE Committee. But only yesterday I was actually speaking in the Employment and Social Affairs Committee, as well as we regularly address a number of other committees. These committees prepare the legislative framework, but they also issue an opinion on budgetary request of the agencies and its discharge. That was the Parliament. In the European Commission, each agency is assigned to a Directorate General in line with the field of activities. Fundamental Rights Agency is attached to the DG Justice. The relevant DG play an important role in assessing the agency's performance, efficiency, and development paths. Where are we going? Now with the new commission on board, we have lots of meetings with the relevant, the new actors in the cabinets with the commissioners to discuss what are the agenda, what are their wishes, what are their requests. In short, the EU institutions and bodies hold the agencies politically financially and judicially accountable for our activities. On top of that, stakeholders also work very closely with many agencies, providing valuable input to the tasks being carried out. Researchers from across the union are feeding into the work uh, of the agencies. Agencies like my own, the Fundamental Rights Agency, but also the EU Borders Agency, Frontex, uh, EASO, Asylum Support Office, the Food Safety Authority, EFSA, and others have also established a platform for civil society. So not only interacting with experts, but also having an active in, uh, interaction with civil society organizations, which is very beneficial. In addition, many EU agencies are forging ever closer ties to member states through focal points in national administrations, national liaison officers, as well as to national parliaments. And here the Fundamental Rights Agency have taken an important step uh, a year ago where we have now appointed uh, focal points in all the national parliaments, all the parliaments, in order to ensure a more consistent uh, and continuous dialogue with the national parliaments. But we also interact with corresponding national bodies, institutions. So in that way, you can also say agencies tie Europe together. Experts in governments, as well as university experts, civil societies, 
meet within the framework of agencies, exchange their views, and develop an Europe and tie it together. Finally, I would say on this regard that a number of agencies are also convening uh, working parties of member state representatives to discuss particular issues. So in conclusion, we are formally held accountable to EU institutions and we feel accountable also to EU citizens. The democratic deficit of the EU institution bodies and agencies have been a concern for decades. Much has changed and improved and yet more can still be done to increase citizens' trust in the EU. Of course, this debate takes place in a time of economic financial crisis with budgetary constraints, and the agencies are, of course, ready to also bear our part of this burden. But at the same time, we also continue to play our part in assisting the EU and its member states to stimulate growth, create jobs, and build more inclusive societies in Europe. So, as I said, I hope that this can be the beginning of a fruitful uh, exchange. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Now I'd like to give the floor to our colleague Sir William Cash for his uh, presentation. Ten minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm extremely glad to have this opportunity to speak to you, and uh, I would add that my speech is on the table in the ostrich room outside if anyone's interested to have a look at it again. And I'm also extremely glad to hear Ms. Uh, Morton accepting the need to address the democratic deficit, because that is in the interest of everybody, uh, both within the um, European institutions and also uh, to address this particular issue. Uh, this debate, Mr. Chairman, has its focus uh, on the democratic control of European agencies and therefore it also raises the question of the extent of the engagement by the national parliaments. This control is currently seriously deficient. The problem is symptomatic of the democratic deficit problem which affects the EU as a whole. I do not believe, myself, that it is possible, despite all the talk about complementarity and cooperation, to have two governments and two parliaments covering the same subject matter, and I expect that the people of the United Kingdom are going to confront this issue and make a decision. I hope personally that they will decide in favour of the UK Parliament reasserting sovereignty but, of course, with political cooperation and trade with Europe. I'm, in fact, introducing a bill in the House of Commons tomorrow concerning all this, which has strong support. In the UK, we believe that our Westminster Parliament is, as David Cameron said in his Bloomberg speech, the root of our democracy. People have fought and died for this democracy over many generations. And in my exchange yesterday with Prime Minister Renzi, I said that I agreed with reform but that the existence of the acquis, which we must remember was voluntarily given to the EU by us, the national parliaments, is ultimately dependent on its continuing acceptance by national voters and whether it works for them. The law is not an end to itself. It depends on trust, consent, and acceptance. The trust has gone. We therefore, as I said to Mr. Renzi, must resolve this by a radical redesigning of the treaties to regain that trust and to return the fundamental democracy which resides in national parliaments whilst recognizing European parliamentary involvement. If we do not, the fault lies with us as national parliamentarians. This agency issue is an example. There are 32 agencies, which is far too many, and some of them have immense influence, even effective control. The 2012 Common Approach to Decentralized Agencies bypasses accountability of these agencies by national parliaments. Instead, the focus is merely on the production of an annual report. It is also critical that there are improved cost efficiencies in agency spending, which in 2013 amounted to 775 million euros. With respect to the Fundamental Rights Agency, the UK insists that the collapse of the pillar structure 
has not extended the mandate of the agency. Furthermore, at the time of the Lisbon Treaty in the UK, both the Labour and the Conservative government, uh, the, and the Conservatives, the Labour government and the Conservative opposition rejected the F Charter of Fundamental Rights. But the European Court of Justice has now ruled that it is applicable to the UK with immense consequences for our judicial system. My European Scrutiny Committee has proposed that the UK should pass an Act of Parliament excluding that Charter of Fundamental Rights from our judicial system. Turning to Europol, the House of Commons has insisted that Article 9 of the Protocol 1 to the EU Treaties on the Role of National Parliaments demonstrates that it is not for the European Parliament unilaterally to decide how national parliaments should ensure political oversight of Europol. Trilogue negotiations are ongoing on the proposal to reform Europol, and it is understood that the discussions on parliamentary scrutiny provisions will commence next week. It is important that Council adopt a strong position in these discussions, and I would therefore urge colleagues to raise with their government ministers any attempt by the EU institutions to prescribe and impose a new model of scrutiny on national parliaments must be resisted. Turning now to Eurojust, there is a current proposal to strengthen this agency and to accommodate the European public prosecutor, which might take over much of the Eurojust, Eurojust jurisdiction. But the European public prosecutor was confirmed by the Commission despite a clear yellow card which passed the threshold of national parliaments. As this proposal currently stands, the president of the Eurojust College would only be required to appear before the European Parliament and not national parliaments. It is disturbing that in the response by national parliaments to the biannual report, 22 out of the 38 parliaments and chambers stated that it had never carried out an overall consideration of the role, functions, and accountability mechanisms of the EU agency or any specific agency. Surely this is a staggering omission, for we as national parliamentarians can only be held to blame. You may understand, therefore, why we believe in the UK that this accountability must be demanded. Certainly, 14 chambers understood the importance of control in their responses, but the situation remains profoundly unsatisfactory because the agencies are simply not, despite their funding, effectively controlled. In my judgment, this is a typical example of the dysfunctionality of the EU, which comes from the lack of accountability and democratic deficit. It is no good saying that we want st strong parliamentary scrutiny, as half of the respondents did, but do nothing about it. I welcome the fact yesterday that the chairpersons endorsed a composite amendment put forward by the House of Commons and the Irish Parliament, which says that it is essential to explore how to monitor such agencies by national parliaments. I think if I ought to add the House of Lords as well. A, a Troika amendment was also endorsed, which states that EU agencies should be encouraged to inform national parliaments on their activities and work program. Information is not enough. This attitude is symptomatic of the endemic problem, as if information is regarded as a substitute for accountability. Accountability requires questions from democratically elected representatives in national parliaments and answers to these questions. This sphere needs fundamental democratic reform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you to uh, Sir William. I'd like to inform you that uh, the um, Signatures room, the documentation which uh, participants to COSAC um, on the part of uh, Mr. Kerum is available. Now, on our list, we have nine speakers. I would say um, if we agree, we could close the list and we could set a uh, time of one and a half minutes for each speaker so that we have time for replies. And uh, so then we can uh, deal with the contribution and conclusions uh, according to our schedule. If there are no objections to that, I'd move on to our discussion. The first person on the list is our colleague Borko uh, from France. Colleagues, 
I'm just going to make one point. We've, I've been a member of the Council of Europe since 2004, and I was always surprised to see that we created um, these agencies within the European Union. I know that this was the result of negotiations between heads of state when we wanted these agencies. Sorry. So I'll repeat, I'm a member of the Council of Europe for about 10 years now. I was always surprised to see the creation of the Fundamental Rights Agency that was a result of negotiations between heads of state and Austria that could continue to work the way it does at the moment. On the one hand, we have the Fundamental Rights Agency, and on the other hand, we have the Council of Europe. I've been a member of the Legal Council of Europe, and the Legal Council in Paris met at 10th December, and it spoke about the fact that we were delayed in terms of the numbers of um, legal petitions put forward by countries like Turkey, for example. And we need to solve this. Second, the Council of Europe has a lot less resources than the agencies. It's seen its budget reduced, and I think that a problem here exists, and we need to ensure that the EU has more means at place so that it can work in that manner. These two structures are concurrent and useful if they have consultation between them. Thank you, colleagues. I think this has uh, consequences on the work that we do in Europe and on the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our colleague Ducam from Belgium. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, part pour... Thank you, President. On the one hand, um, we've decided to look at this important issue today. Thank you for that, and thank you to the Secretary of COSAC for your very detailed report, which allows us national parliaments to focus on the whole problem. I'm a bit surprised of the extremely different uh, tones between us here in terms of the two speakers we've heard. On the one hand, we have the big democratic challenge. On the other hand, we have someone stating that it's going to work out well. I think the European Parliament is doing its expected work in terms of control, but this should be reorganized in the future. We need to have parliamentary control. And that is the primary mission of the European Parliament, to leave it clear that for a certain number of the 41 agencies, based on their differences, we would like to see national parliaments more associated with this approach for the European Parliament's control in terms of justice, policing, immigration, etc. We would like to see and this will be part of a text that we will bring to the Belgian Parliament, we would like to see more agencies, more proactive in relation to a certain number of specialized national committees at the national parliament level. Certainly, we need exchange of information. We need explanations. We need pedagogy. These are key elements in the struggle. With transparency, this will allow us to fight against your skepticism in Europe and to fight against the, the attempts of some to destruct uh, Europe from the inside out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, colleague uh, Ramazanolu from Turkey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nowadays, many EU agencies play an important role in implementing EU policies in various fields. The agencies help the institutions concentrate on policy-making tasks and contribute to the enhancement of cooperation between member states, candidate countries, and the EU in important areas. We are supporting a stronger role for national parliaments regarding the democratic control of these agencies. More instruments should be given to national parliaments, enabling them to monitor EU agencies by enhancing contacts and cooperation. We are ready to give any kind of support to these relations. Candidate countries and potential candidate countries are able to take part in EU programs on the basis of framework agreements 
and can participate in EU agencies through a case-by-case -case basis. Like any other EU institution, all European agencies should be subject to well-established accountability and transparency mechanisms. Therefore, my question is, what kind of effective ways and instruments for control and supervising of these agencies do you think as necessary and important? Thank you. Thank you, colleague. Uh, Boswell from uh, the UK. I was told. Bo Boswell. Uh, was there a mistake? It should also be your birthday today, as far as I know. And so um, we'll wish you a uh, happy birthday. That is very gracious of you, Mr. President. I know enough Italian to understand what you said. Can I just say, um, the House of Lords wants effective scrutiny of all agencies. With regard to Europol, of particular interest to us, we take the view in this case that the Commission proposals for parliamentary scrutiny are very much what is needed. However, there are amendments to this regulation proposed by the European Parliament, and we fear that these would raise significant issues of constitutional principle. And also, in practical terms, there is a danger that they might lead to the creation of a supervisory body which would lack the desired flexibility and responsiveness essential for such arrangements. I hope that this matter can be considered and resolved in a friendly way and that we will continue to work case by case, agency by agency, to ensure that we have the right mechanism for scrutiny, both at European and national level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, colleague Hansen from Norway. Thank you, Chair. As fully integrated members of the EU internal market and Schengen, Norway participates in several EU agencies. When the European Parliament and national parliaments now discuss democratic control over these agencies, we believe MPs from the Norwegian Parliament and the other EFTA EA parliaments should be considered as permanent observers in, this, in the new interparliamentary processes. Two agencies are of special interest for us, are uh, Europol and Eurojust. In 2001, Norway was the first country to sign an operational agreement with Europol. The cooperation has proven to be mutual uh, beneficial. Norway has, um, uh, is among those countries who exchange most information with Europol and the level of information exchange is increasing. The Norwegian Parliament thus welcomes the latest proposal from the European Commission for a regulation on Europol. Uh, and therefore, we take a special interest in the parliamentary scrutiny of this agency uh, and would like to be associated when this is finalized by the European Parliament and national parliaments in EU. We work, worked closely with the latest European Parliament on an amendment uh, which would allow for our participation and we will continue to work with the new European Parliament and Council on this and hope for the support and understanding uh, of uh, colleagues, both in national parliaments and the European Parliament. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, colleague Lamaris from Cyprus. Thank you very much indeed, President. We welcome today's discussion on this very important subject because the role and the contribution of these organizations to their areas of competence is very essential and decisive. Of course, the circumstances governing the situation which prevails today are very far away from the present situation and therefore need to be adapted into appropriate form. And we therefore need a revision at this point on EU level. Under these economically difficult situations, which our member states and peoples are living in today, it's becoming more and more evidently necessary 
to clearly define um, the role of the mechanisms which are in play here. We need more transparency, we need more clear administration, and we need accountability for the European Union institutions vis-a-vis -vis the member states. We're talking about over 30 agencies here. However, there doesn't seem to be any agency working in the field of uh, foreign policy, security, and defense. And therefore, I think we need to have this discussion with uh, respect to this area as well. And we need to try and define the role and the character of what we need today for these agencies, what their role should be today. And that includes a security and defense mechanism, obviously. Obviously, we also need to strengthen the relations between these agencies and the national parliaments and the European Parliament. That's also a task for us to fulfill. And it's important for us to be able to see their annual problem, their annual programs and their annual reports, which need to be sent to us, not just to the European Parliament. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Um, colleague Hennigan from Ireland. Thank you, Chair. Ireland welcomes the opportunity to contribute to this important topic, which we consider is under-discussed relative to the number of European agencies, their influence on European policies and on the lives of EU citizens, and their collective budgets, amounting to 775 million. However, as these agencies carry out their specified roles, transparency and accountability of their work must be paramount. With more than 40 European agencies, Adequate oversight of these agencies should be of major concern within the EU. As Sir William Cash has said, Ireland believes that the role of national parliaments in terms of the establishment and oversight of the activities of European agencies should be further explored, and the existing mechanisms do not fully recognise the role of national parliaments in all cases. While Ireland recognises the need for European agencies, we consider that each proposed agency and its establishment should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. On the proposal to establish the European Public Prosecutor's Office, Ireland believes that the EU Commission did not adequately consider the option of strengthening existing or alternative mechanisms, but assumed that the establishment of a supranational prosecution and investigative agency is the only way that EU budget-related fraud can be addressed. Ireland submitted a reasoned opinion to the EU Commission for that reason. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And now, colleague Tragakis from Greece. Thank you very much indeed, President. The precise role of European agencies is often a question mark for us. And in the biannual report uh, of COSAC, uh, we see that despite the fact that the role of these uh, European agencies is growing, they are not provided with uh, the right funds and staff, and also not with um, the rules and regulations that they need in order to actually carry out their role. And uh, the national parliaments uh, haven't had a chance to deal with these subjects either. For example, the national parliaments of countries on the borders of the European Union, of course, have to deal with uh, the repercussions of the rising migration flow on a daily basis. and. Obviously, these parliaments are very much up to date on the problems that are arising. And this became very clear during the Greek presidency of the European Union. And uh, at this time, we discussed the European uh, Sea Security Strategy, which was adopted by the General Affairs Council in July of this year. And it's being carried forward during the Italian presidency at present. And we hope that it will lead to a very detailed action plan. I think the role of the European agencies in this framework has to be decisive. And I'm sure that we can all help uh, this contribution to be carried out in practice. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hopkins, UK. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, first of all, may I say how much I endorse the words of my parliamentary colleague, Sir William Cash, um, strongly support his view. And democracy has various interpretations, but it must not be merely a decoration, not tokenistic, not a top-down arrangement where those who govern, including officials and bureaucrats, continue to act without any effective constraint from below. Democracy should be bottom-up from our citizens. It must also take account of minority views, allowing opposing views to be heard and recognized. It must not be monolithic and centralist. Democracy must, above all, keep open the possibility of change, even radical change, and reversals of established policies. Our conference today includes many admirable colleagues, but I have to ask, where are the voices of trade unionists, of workers, of the left, of the millions of unemployed and the poor, of those who question the economic strategy of the EU, a strategy which does not appear to be working for millions of the disadvantaged in Europe. Fundamental rights should include the right to work, a right currently being denied to millions with little prospect uh, of employment for the immediate and even future and even longer. Decades after the Second World War, we had full employment, so it is possible to create jobs. We should revisit those policies which achieve full employment. Thank you. Thank you. Now our last uh, person on our list, uh, colleague Hübner from uh, Austria. Thank you very much indeed, President. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank our colleague Cash, above all, for what he had to say. I have to say I was extremely pleased with his words because he really gave us a streamlined um, presentation of what is behind all of this, in my opinion. And that's what we really need. Because yesterday, of course, we spent lots of time praising the European Union and saying that there's no alternative to any of this. But I think at the same time, it's very important with respect to these so-called agencies, for example, to see what you really need and what you don't need. I would say about 50% of what they do is simply not necessary. I'll be bold enough to say that. Our French colleague, Pozzi di Borgo, said um, that um, an agreement was reached with Austria or a contract with Austria was signed uh, uh, with respect um, to these agencies, but uh, that's not quite true. Actually, a racism observity was uh, set up at the time because of um, the fact that uh, allegedly we had not uh, lived up to certain standards after our elections and after um, one then subsequently saw that it was really not necessary to observe anything anymore in Austria, the whole thing was scrapped. In any case, I think it's very um, important to say what's going wrong in the European Union as well. And as our colleague Kash said, which I thought was very much to the point, the uh, tasks that the European Union has to fulfill were assigned to the European Union by its peoples, and they can be taken away by the peoples of Europe again. Thank you to all the colleagues who took the floor. And now for five minutes, we'll be uh, giving uh, the floor to our keynote speakers for the replies. And I'd like to start by giving the floor to Sir William Cash. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I must say that uh, I've been extremely pleased by the uh, consensus, if I may put it that way, about the issue of democratic control of EU agencies. It is really important that we concentrate on this and that the national parliaments do in fact um, do, do, it, do something about it and not merely uh, go on talking about it. Um, I was particularly interested in uh, the remarks which were made by Mr. Borgo from, from France. Um, and also uh, very gratified to hear uh, from Belgium as well regarding the specialized national work that needed to be done. Um, I would say that with respect to uh, the question of uh, Europol, um, my colleague from the House of Lords quite rightly pointed out that there is a constitutional principle involved here and uh, also that t both Turkey and Norway who are not existing members of the European Union 
felt that it was important for them to say something about this because it is so essential that if they are to be involved in EU framework arrangements, um, that they should also have a right to be heard and to insist on national engagement. Um, I very much agreed with the Cypriot uh, concern for revision of the EU uh, transparency and accountability side of the equation and very, very much endorsed the Irish contribution, which was extremely well stated. And this business of the yellow card is really quite outrageous. It's one thing for us to be told as national parliamentarians that there's an EU rule of law, but when they don't even abide by the rule of law according to their own procedures on the yellow card, then one or two people might be seriously concerned about the uh, consistency um, of the in European institutions themselves. And I simply haven't been able to understand how it is that when the reasoned opinions pass the threshold, that um, the European Commission can just carry on as if nothing had happened. It just seems absolutely astonishing to me. This is a perfect example of the democratic deficit being bypassed. Um, uh, I obviously am very glad to hear what my colleague from uh, the United Kingdom said, uh, Kelvin Hopkins, and uh, very much agree with his approach to this question. I'm extremely glad also to hear from Mr. Hubner, uh, and, and I'm extremely uh, glad to hear his remarks, because this is not just, if I may say by way of conclusion in my response, uh, a matter of individual case-by-case -case operations. It is about some very fundamental principles, which is the kind of Europe that people want out there in the electorates. As I said yesterday, uh, there is a very, very serious question mark over the trust in the European project. And for all the things that I voted for when I voted yes in the referendum in 1975, because I do believe we want a stable Europe, we have also got to recognize that the real question at the heart of everything that the original founding fathers wanted was to have a democratic and a workable system. And it's the instability that has come about and the difficulties that that has uh, created which have got to be rectified in the way in which I've tried to identify it. But I'm extremely grateful for the general attitude of everybody here with regard to these questions and I just simply say that I hope that we can produce a very stable Europe which is based on uh, proper principles of democratic accountability and trust. Thank you very much. Grazie. <clears throat> Thank you to a colleague. And now I'd like to give the floor to um, Mr. Kerem. Director of FRA and coordinator of the network of European agencies. Have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, thank you very much for the very rich uh, comments that we have taken due note of and, of course, we'll be bring back to our colleagues uh, in the network. And I also really want to thank the Italian presidency for having taken this initiative, which I definitely, from the comments, uh, feel that it is there's a certain urgency that we need to strengthen. Uh, the dialogue, the interaction between the national parliaments and the agencies. Let's recall one thing, and that is that the agencies are in member states. They are right, they are in the, your neighborhood. So if you are, so to say, feel you're not sufficiently informed about what they're doing, they are there. And I think that's also one of the strengths about the agencies is that they are at the national level. They are anchored in member states, of course, working on the European level but are living their everyday life in member states. Secondly, what was discussed by many was the transparency, the accountability, the insight, what is going on in these agencies. And to uh, echo what Bill said, uh, let's do something. Let's, let's take some steps, let's not just talk about it, as you rightly say. I think the reading of the report was a bit depressing. When I say, let's, let's, uh, so let's move. And uh, three points. The Fundamental Rights Agency and I think a few others have created focal points. Let's get focal points from all the key agencies in national parliaments so you get a steady flow of what is being done. 
that's a minimum, I would say. Secondly, you have uh, members of the management boards in all the agencies. There are national members. Are they ever invited to committee meetings in your parliament when all the different issues are being discussed to enlighten the relevant committee on what is the view, what is the take, what are the developments in this or that particular agency? Thirdly, I'm quite certain that most of, if not all of my colleagues, the other directors of agencies, would be more than pleased to come and visit and give a presentation and have an interaction uh, with you in your national parliament on what they are doing, their functions, their agendas for the future. I never visit personally, I never visit a member state without calling the parliament to actually say, I'm here, I'm on a visit, uh, are you interested in meeting? Have I ever been called? Mm, I don't think it happened a few times and there are a few parliamentary committees uh, visiting us that we are very pleased, very favor that the parliamentary committees when they are in Vienna anyway, that they come by and see us. It is this trust building, it is the way of building the knowledge. And I think if we, that knowledge is being built, I don't think that uh, the overall view would be that a lot of the agencies are redundant and could just be closed. Well, to what I know about my colleagues and what they're doing in other agencies, it's extremely meaningful. It's meaningful for you, it's meaningful for the European citizens on a very daily basis. Let me just wind up by saying that there have been a process uh, between the institutions, the uh, Parliament, Commission and Council, there was an inter-institutional working group that concluded its work uh, a year ago and we are now implementing and are almost finished in uh, coming to the end of implementing the decisions made by the inter-institutional uh, working group. A new working group has been established uh, to take the work further. We very much appreciate that. One demand that we have is that the agencies are being listened more to, are being brought further into the work uh, of the inter-institutional working group so there is a, a real dialogue uh, about what happens uh, in the agencies. So once again, thanks a lot for this uh, frank, open exchange. It's much appreciated, and uh, we will take it back to our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kierum. This means we finish this um, session too, and I'd like to uh, hand over the chair to my colleague um, Kitty for the continuance of our proceedings. So I think we come to the last point, the last item on our agenda, which is the adoption of the contribution and conclusions of the 52nd uh, COSAC. We've distributed the texts, uh, the relevant texts, and I must say that we had uh, a very thorough uh, discussion of these uh, texts. It was very uh, intense, uh, constructive, and uh, thorough, as I said. And I would, would like to thank our Troika colleagues and also the chairpersons of the delegations um, here at COSAC. Yesterday, we spent more than two hours on uh, this. We examined all the uh, items in the final texts, um, and I think that we can be satisfied with the outcome. I personally am satisfied because uh, we listened to each other very uh, carefully. There was there were no um, points uh, of uh, nobody had any. Um, prejudices or pre-formed ideas, and I think we all worked together to find uh, solutions to our differences. And uh, this is the basis of democracy, discussion, respecting people's positions and uh, taking uh, a responsibility for decisions, taking into account the overall uh, picture. And these uh, basics of democracy are even more necessary in interparliamentary organizations such as ours, I believe, because it is clear that if in uh, 
Cossack and uh, if in the um, CFSP and CSDP uh, committees we weren't uh, able to cooperate effectively, we um, would be undermining, uh, undermining our cooperation, uh, whereas we want to uh, achieve the opposite goal. So, from the presidency, we'd now like to ask you whether we can adopt the uh, contribution and the conclusion of the 52nd COSAC. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Chigana asked for the floor. You asked for the floor, President Chigana? Yes, thank you very much, uh, President Kitty, for chairing uh, this debate and for the warm welcome that uh, our delegation received. This is the first COSA conference for me, but it has been extremely fruitful and I've really enjoyed the discussions. I do hope that we will be able to adopt conclusions uh, effectively uh, with discussion, uh, but also agree uh, on common approach. Uh, we've invested time in discussing them and I think they are really uh, strong and strikes a good, strike a good balance. I would also like to welcome you to Riga as the incoming presidency. We will have two major Cossack events, uh, one in the beginning of February, and that is the chairperson's meeting, and the second one, of course, our plenary in the end of April, beginning of uh, May. And during those meetings, we will discuss uh, many important issues. First of all, we will talk about the priorities of our presidency, which is engaged Europe, competitive Europe, and also digital Europe. We will be happy to discuss these issues with you. We will also discuss the European Commission priorities. We will talk about the energy union. We will discuss TTIP. Uh, which is also a very interesting topic. Uh, we will talk about the future uh, of the parliamentary scrutiny of uh, the EU affairs, which has been raised here several times and is important. And of course, we will focus also on the Eastern Partnership uh, that we discussed in detail today in the morning. In total, we, have, we will have six different conferences in our parliamentary dimension, and I'm very happy to announce these events here. Should you have more questions, we are open to questions, comments, uh, specific calendars, but uh, really most welcome uh, to Riga uh, in the beginning of next year. And now we will have to leave for the airport, so I see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, of course, and we uh, do um, wish you uh, great success to the La Latvian presidency, and we shall obviously meet again in the Riga. So we consider adopted the contribution and conclusions of the 52nd COSAC. Can we uh, adopt them then? Thank you then. Uh, so this brings us to the end uh, of our meeting. I'd like to thank you all for having come to the Italian Senate, for having contributed to the um, positive outcome of a meeting. I'd like to thank the COSAT Secretariat for all the work it's done in uh, helping the presidency. I'd like to thank the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate uh, of the Republic who um, assisted our work, our interpreters, for the quality of the work. And I also wish to uh, renew my best wishes to Lord Boswell because uh, he gave us a good example. He spent his birthday working with us and uh, therefore uh, we truly express our best wishes to you. And I uh, wish you a um, safe return home and uh, I also, since we're not far, uh, I also wish you a... Um, Wish you the best for Christmas and the new year. And uh, thank you again. Yeah.